for him when that's happened, please? Yes, convener, just in terms of the, the deputation of Mr. Anderson, Mark Anderson, I contacted him today, and I think it's just himself who will be representing Skills Academy, and I've advised IT host to allow Mr. Anderson into the meeting now. Okay, thank you. Okay. Convener, could I just interject here? I was declaring an interest on this item and would have left the room. Um, maybe guidance from legal whether I should leave during the presentation or not. I've got I've got you further down the list for this actually. But per perhaps uh, Mr. McCaskill, would you like to give advice, or Ms. Mrs. Buchanan? Uh, can be. I wouldn't be giving legal advice. That's from Mrs. Buchanan. But in terms of my advice, would be that um, as the deputation relates to an item to which Councillor Duff has indicated that he has an interest, which would uh, that requires him to leave the meeting. Uh, my my advice would be that he it would be of no import for him to be in the meeting whilst the deputation was heard, and also um, arguably his declaration of interest would cover that point too. But I would defer to Mrs. Buchanan just to confirm if that is the case. Thank you. Mrs. Buchanan there. She's still on mute. Somebody unmute, Mrs. Buchanan. I've asked uh, the host to do that from the outset, convener. It uh, seems to be on, on my my machine. She's unmuted. That's you. Mrs. Buchanan is un unmuted now. Convener. Thank you. Must be her end, convener. Yeah, looks like it. Okay. Councillor Duff, if you don't mind, can we just move on and uh, we'll get to the, like, the, I'll just get to the declarations of interest and you can declare your interest then. Okay, right. Okay, so I'll go to uh, uh, apologies and substitutes. Um, I've got yes. apologies from Councillor Devine with yes. Councillor Whiteside substituting. That's correct, Convener. Thank you. And well, declarations of interest. Uh, I was going to remind members that we've got them to get them in ASAP. Um, Councillor Duff. Yeah, thanks, Convener. Um, I'd like to declare an interest as a council appointed director of, of Angus Alive. Item five report. 15120, where I would want to leave the meeting and not participate. And item eight, uh, 17420, where I would, uh, would attend the meeting and would be prepared to vote. There's no financial interest by myself. So that's my declaration. <coughs> Thank you, Councillor Duff. Okay, from there then, uh, obviously we've um, agreed the, uh, the deputation. Um, uh, I think, can we perhaps say, uh, straight? Hang on a second. Instead of waiting, wait, can can we now move to item number five and take the um, the cat decision for Skills Academy? Is that agreed? Agreed. 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 Okay. Thank you. Can Mark Anderson? Convener, um, Mrs. Wal Mrs. Buchanan wasn't able to speak, but she has confirmed to me that Councillor Duff should leave the meeting for the deputation part as well. Okay. So, okay. Councillor Duff. Could we just pause just a moment so, yeah. so IT host can uh, allow Councillor Duff uh, to leave the Zoom meeting, please? Councillor Duff's now left the meeting. Thank you. Can we have uh, Mark Anderson from Skills Academy, please? Ah, uh, yeah. Can everybody hear? Yeah. 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 Yes, Dan. Yeah. <laughs> good, good, good afternoon. 
Uh, Mark, you, Mark, you have 10 minutes. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so the purpose of this um, was to address some issues that were noted in the report 151-20 uh, regarding our CAT application. Uh, so I'll just go through them bit by bit, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, so we'll start off at 4.6. Um, so the applicant advises that the contractors would require exclusive and unrestricted access to the area for the period of removal and installation of a new surface, which would need to be agreed in consultation with Angus Council. Um, we have spoken with various contractors who have given a, a project timescale of approximately three weeks for phase one. Therefore, if accepted, we would work with Angus Council to complete the installation at appropriate time, which causes the least disruption. We will be flexible and schedule the work during the school holiday period, and most likely installation timescale would be during the summer holidays of 2021, which will cause no disruption to Arbroath High School and minimal disruption to Angus Alive. Um, we'll then move on to um, point 5.3. Point um, so it can be noted that our business plan indicates £60 per hour as a mean average as part of our financial forecast. However, we will ensure that prices are fair and inclusive to all and offer best value. We are keen to consult with all relevant parties to ensure that our pricing system is flexible and takes into consideration the needs of the community as a whole, helping to reduce inequalities, especially those living in poverty. We are keen to ensure that after school, an act of schools volunteer-led physical activity is a key priority and are committed to extending the school act of schools use until 5 p.m. each weekday. Skills Academy work closely with active schools and we fully support after school activity with a cost of nothing, ensuring those who are disadvantaged have access to physical activity. Um, I would take this on then to point 5.5. .5. Uh, which speaks about the uh, Angus Alive current CAT score. Um, so we'd like to address some of the claims by Angus Alive, which we believe to be inaccurate and therefore affect the current overall CAT scoring. Um, but these will be addressed later uh, in, this, uh, in this deputation. Um, I'll move on to 6.2, and I'll come back to that point in a moment. Uh, Skills Academy recognise that the school and active schools will require additional hours uh, to the proposed facility. And we agree that access to the facility will be in line with current arrangements, 8, to 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday to Friday. We also work with the school, the PE department, and active schools to ensure some degree of flexibility is given to single events that occur throughout the year out with these times. It then goes on to speak about access and security at uh, subpoint B. Um, there are currently three entry points for access to the AstroTurf, and we're willing to work with the school, again, Angus Alive and the Education Lifelong Learning Service to agree a suitable arrangement around this. C is about the management of the construction phase. Again, I've just spoke about that as a three-week time scale. Therefore, we would look to minimise disruption by consulting with all parties prior to commencement and will aim to carry it out during school holidays. Subpoint D is around the energy source. We have consulted with a local electrical contractor. We've been told it would be a five-figure amount, but that varies, obviously, job dependent. Uh, which So we're looking between 10 and 20,000 pounds on top of our funding. Uh, we're confident that we'll secure this additional funding as part of particularly phases two and three of our plan. And we would look to come to an agreement with Angus Alive and the council to use and have access to the current source up until that point, and we would take over payment of the meter. Point E, around changing facilities. We have been in discussion with the Scottish Football Partnership uh, to acquire funding for two port cabin changing facilities, which is part of our phase one plan and within the plan. We have been advised that we have a strong case to acquire this funding. This has been included in our fundraising strategy. These facilities will take, uh, sorry, relieve pressure on Angus Alive and there will be no expectation that users will use Angus Alive changing facilities or the toilets, as these will be included. Point F is around community access and pricing. Again, I've said we're willing to work with Angus Alive, the council and the school to negotiate a fair and inclusive pricing structure which benefits the community. We're willing to match the current school Angus Alive agreement for a minimum period of three years as part of a service level agreement. We we'll then move us on to point 6.5. Um, 
Skills Academy are willing to match the current school I guess live agreement for a minimum period of three months, three years, as I said, to ensure that there are no additional costs. Any additional costing to creating a dedicated access route would be factored in to our funding grants once agreed in discussion with Angus Live or the Council, but it is hoped that we can agree an access point that is already in place. 6.6 .6, uh, speaks about funding, so from discussions with the various funders, they have communicated to us that we must have our CAT assessment transfer agreement approved before applying for funding. We are willing to enter an agreement with a timescale in which funding must be secured by Skills Academy for the project. 8.1, Angus Council were awarded funding approximately 14 years ago to help build an astroturf for the benefit of the community. There is no evidence to support that the Council have budgeted accordingly for the resurfacing of the astroturf which is recommended for every sort of 8 to 10 years. There is also no evidence to suggest that there is a sufficient budget or means to replace an existing surface which is unsafe and unsuitable for participation which is a huge loss to the local community. Skills Academy have created a detailed business plan and fundraising strategy that will secure the income for the upgrading of the facilities and is budgeted for the resurfacing of the Astro within an 8-10 to 10 year time scale. We believe we are in a strong position to meet community needs as detailed by the support letters by upgrading the Astro turf which has been greatly underused for the last few years. We will then move us on to Appendix 2 of Report 15120. Um, so there's part of it there around Sports Scotland facility strategy, um, where Angus Alive said they would get refunding for that from Sports Scotland. However, it stated that they, um, from their facility strategy, they won't refund a surface of a synthetic pitch for the same organisation. Seem to be working now. Who have already received funding. However, they will fund the resurfacing of a previously funded synthetic pitch from a different organisation. And this was confirmed via telephone conversation between Skills Academy and the Sports Scotland facilities funding manager. Scottish Rugby uh, have met with Andy Cummins, our regional manager for Scottish Rugby, and discussions took place regarding funding. We've also discussed the use of AstroTurf for the training of rugby and involved Arbroath Rugby in discussions. They indicated they were keen to utilise the AstroTurf and support this project. Arbroath High School, our chair, Billy Mitchell, met with Bruce Pritchard, the head teacher, Kelly McIntosh, who is now the Director of Learning, to discuss the project. We've also consulted with the PE department, with the school, who would be the main users of the surface. They are fully supportive of the project, however, it has to be noted that as they are council employees, including school staff, they cannot endorse the project publicly due to conflict of interest. I would move us on to Appendix 3, which was a letter from the Communities um, Support Services team. So again, reference to accessing it at certain times, we were willing to extend the times we would open it up, um, keen to work with the PE department for after schools curriculum, um, to make sure that that is the same as the agreement now with Angus Live. We're keen to work in partnership with schools and Angus Live to find solutions to access the AstroTurf, which was also highlighted in this letter. Again, we spoke about the three instances, we were hoping to uh, come to an agreement to find one that we can use. The pricing structure or our pricing structure was questioned um, as they spoke about their pricing structure. However, in 2019-20 that they claimed in their report was inaccurate. They claimed that some of the pricing was for two hours, however it was for one hour uh, for a match and uh, so it should there have been double. I look at and appreciate they have since updated the pricing structure which is more in line with what ours is but I certainly wouldn't say that ours was going to be uh, un not inclusive to the community in terms of them accessing it. There's also questions about the drainage system of the AstroTurf. We had a specialist community, a specialist AstroTurf team come out and give us a quote. They don't feel there is an issue with the drainage system as such. The issue is with the AstroTurf and that it's been so poorly managed and not updated that the, the, it's been clogged. Now they're confident that when the new surface is put down, the drainage would be okay and wouldn't require updated. Um, we'd also note that Angus Alive quoted prices for the Webster High School as a comparison on their report for our pricing. However, I would note that the Webster Kerry Muir pricing is for a nine aside pitch and not an 11 aside pitch, just for comparison. Um, and I'll finish off with Angus Alive speak of the belief that the renovation of the pitch will lead to great demand amongst community clubs and groups. It leads me to ask why then they've not previously updated the pitch or had a sinking fund to allow cash to be held yearly to ensure at the end of the pitch's lifespan it can be replaced. We have this built into our business plan and have made allowances for reduced usage 
when we develop the plan for instances such as perhaps pandemics where people weren't using it as often. Uh, we will have finance in place to fully renew the pitch solely from income generation from hires so it becomes self-sustainable and not consistently relying on external funding. I find it hard to accept as a resident of our growth that the Angus Alive pose a better option than a community-led model. The days of a community facility funded by the public and having no real community benefit have to be gone in this day and age. We want local clubs as seen in the support letters to be part of how we run the facility and have a voice. We will develop partnerships and reinvest income generated in the local programmes for the community. This will have employment and socio-economic benefits for the community. This will have employ uh, as well as improving economic development, regeneration, public health, social well-being, which are key features in the Council's assessment model. We have a robust business plan that lays out the plan to ensure all three phases. Left, Mark. Okay, it will be delivered. I'll speak quick. <laughs> We've delivered whilst uh, Angus are live in council in consultation with our members to ensure that it is a local community benefit. We're keen to involve primary schools, secondary schools to engage everyone with the support of Dundee and Angus College. We've even spoke about uh, a link up with work placements in terms of sports department, horticulture department, etc., as well as perhaps some form of off-site education provision where we're linking the schools, vocational testers, core skills and the college. To summarise, we'd like to work with Angus Council, Angus Alive, to ensure skills give the community a facility that benefits them, which has sadly failed to date. The track record of upkeep of the facility and the benefit to the community is lacking, and I urge you to consider carefully before making your decision today. We offer a community-led model for the community, ran by the community. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. If you can, well done. <laughs> if you, you can just stay there, Mark. There may be some uh, some questions from some of the the, the members, so I'll op uh, I'll open that up. I've got Councillor Juan. Yes, convener. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Mark, for that. Uh, I did have a list of questions which came off of the uh, the paper as well, but you've answered every single one of them. So I would just like to commend you on that first of all, and thank you for your time with the deputation today. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wan. Councillor Moore. Thank you, convener. I just have one question. Um, why should we accept a CAT application for something that's not been declared surplus to requirement? I don't think that's a question for, uh, uh, for Mr. Anderson. Okay. So, no, that's, that, I can't see how Mr. Anderson could even uh, that I answer that, Councillor Moore. Um, uh, any further, uh, Councillor Whiteside? Thanks, Convener. Um, much like Councillor Wan, I had a list of questions and I think nearly all of them have been answered. Um, so thanks, Mark Anderson. That was a good presentation. I was quite impressed by your bid, um, particularly the list of um, planned activities and community benefit projects, uh, which is very extensive. So just want to congratulate you on that. Um, just a quick question about the estimations of cost. There's a wee bit of a difference between the, your own estimate and the estimate from the council. Are you confident? Have you had a several quotations for the, the replacement cost? He's on mute. Yeah. I'm off now. Is that it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm just checking. I've got it on my phone here. So what I can give is a rundown of what we've been quoted, for example. Um, so preliminary uh, investigations were around about £2,600. Removal of the existing surface and the dispose of the other one off-site was around about £17,500, just under. Um, on the existing shock pad base construction and supply and install of the 3G playing surface was £138,250. That includes the lining for football and other sports. And then after completion of that, we'd have to do a testing of around about two and a half thousand pounds on the surface and the lighting to ensure that we'll have various licenses for various sports. For example, if we're going to play football games or um, like of a, a, a semi-professional level, etc., they'll have to be licensed or um, rugby, etc. So that comes to 160,480, obviously with that. We have a provisional sum as well um, of 52,500 if, if the shock pad and the asphalt base and needs replacing. However, on first inspections, they think that, that won't be replaced at the moment. So that may be a future provision of funding as part of our um, sink fund to go along with the surfacing. I should have said also, it was 
I really welcomed the fact that you'd factored in the replacement costs in the business plan. I think that's a really important um, thing to note. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Whiteside. Any further questions? Mark, no? No, thanks. No. Okay, Mark, thank you very much. If you, you. want to stay and listen um, uh, as we go through your application uh, and see what our final outcome will be. Okay, uh, thank so, you. Thank you. Okay, the uh, committee will just move to uh, item number five. That's the CAT decision for Skills Academy, the Asuka Pitch and Ground. Uh, I have a, a note of two speakers. One is Colin Knight, the Senior Manager of Angus Alive. He would, he would wish to speak. Uh, and Beth Reader from Education would all, also wish to speak. Have we right, agreed to that? Great. Great. Okay, um, as I mentioned Colin first, perhaps I shouldn't have, but I should have been ladies first. But uh, is Colin there and uh, like, like to speak to the application? Well, he was there. Uh, can Hi, you? Can we, uh, yes, I am. Yes, thank you. Sorry, just uh, trying to unmute there. Um, but thank you very much. Um, and, and thanks to Mark for his, his presentation there as well um, today. Um, just to take you through some of the information, uh, particularly focusing on Appendix 2 to Report 15120, uh, which was the information that Angus Alive had submitted, uh, which uh, Mark referred to in his um, deputation there as well. Um, I would summarise, uh, I'll go through some of the points of the, the, the report as we go through. The, we are continually working just now in partnership with Angus Council um, as an organisation, as, as you're aware, as, as Angus Alive. Um, on one of the surfaces that were the facilities, sorry, we do have with the license to occupy and operate is that at Arbro Sports Centre. Um, we are um, excited to have that as part of our portfolio and we are very keen to keep that as part of our portfolio and work with all the community groups in the area and um, to take uh, the, the various projects forward. There has been a piece of work undertaken by our strategic commissioning function colleagues at Angus Council. Uh, which within the report there does um, indicate that there's the, the replacement cost in the region of £220,000 to replace the current surface. We recognise that the current surface is a, a surface that is passed its sell-by date, uh, to use one of a better phrase, and that does need resurfacing. Um, I think it will produce um, a, a surface that uh, local community clubs across a number of different sports would then wish to access and, and access uh, to deliver their services to the local community uh, whether that be to youngsters or any age group within the community and we are certainly keen to, to work uh, to continue to do so. Um, we continue to have a, a very, very positive relationship with the, the school, Arbroath High School, and um, we certainly see that relationship uh, developing recently, um, also with the, the development of the Changing Village uh, on site at the moment. As you'll, most people will be aware on the call, there is the, the Changing Village being installed at the moment. That was um, as mentioned in our report here as well, that was um, highlighted and is funded through Angus Council um, and it came through the school highlighting a number of, of concerns around the, the changing situation at the, the school at, at present and the sports centre. And um, so that work um, indicates that there's a, a long term will to invest in, in the facility at Arbo Sports Centre um, and that's currently owned by Angus Council and operated by ourselves with a licence to occupy and operate. Um, we would like to see that relationship continue um, and that relationship continue to, to flourish as we work through the process. Um, the section in the report with uh, football development, we, we have our football development coordinator and um, was a development officer role previously, now a coordinator role working alongside um, a number of clubs across Angus but also within the Arbroath area um, and Skills Academy are one of those groups that we do work with um, and I, I, we do have a positive working relationship with Skills Academy um, and I'm, I'm hopeful that, that Mr Anderson would testify to that um, and that there is that relationship there particularly in terms of, of programming football in the area so that we're not clashing with what we're trying to do um, but Skills do access a number of our, our sites uh, with us to deliver some of their services. We see that positive relationship continuing um, with, with Skills Academy. We would like to see that continue in a way that we and Angus Council are renovating the, the surface at our growth and we can continue to work with Skills in that manner um, as we move through. Uh, we're also working there in terms of our growth community sport hub, which I know a number of you are involved in um, as well and have awareness of. 
Um, so the, the width and breadth of sports that we work with is there as well in terms of how we would like to see people access the pitch. Um, as, as Mr Anderson has, has rightly highlighted, he just uh, looked at the Sports Scotland section of our report, um, our um, information in there, and we have contacted our partnership manager at Sports Scotland, um, and they've confirmed that they would be keen to work with us um, to develop a funding package and consider funding packages. Um, they could tie in with us a, a number of the governing bodies um, across the country who would be involved in the potential in the pitch, and uh, two of those we mentioned in the report as well. Um, with the, uh, the Scottish FA and also Scottish Rugby. Um, our indication is that the Scottish FA haven't been contacted with regard to this particular um, community asset transfer application. Um, and we have, um, as indicated in the report, spoken to Scottish Rugby and through Andrew Cummings, or Cummins, sorry, um, and th there has been indication there that there, there hasn't been any funding discussed with that, but that is obviously contrary to what uh, Mr Anderson indicated today, but that is the information that we have received directly from that body. I would like at this point just to re-emphasise that we have a very positive working relationship with Sports Scotland. Um, Angus Council and Angus Alive are currently in the middle of a, a four-year partnership agreement with Sports Scotland. Um, we're in year two, just entered year two of that in this current financial year. Um, and that's a very, very positive relationship. Um, there are a number of authorities across the country who have either a one-year or a two-year funding agreement with Sports Scotland, so we are very positive that, that that relationship is there for that length of time, um, and we see this as an opportunity to build on that relationship with Sports Scotland. Um, our relationship with the school, as I touched upon there, um, the indication that we've made in the report is that the high school, you know, that there is indication from Skills Academy, apologies, that uh, the high school have supported the project, uh, the information that we have from discussions with the school, um, and I know um, Beth is on the call today as well. Um, and from speaking to the head teacher on, on site particularly, um, who we do have a working relationship with on a regular basis, um, was that there were concerns around the application um, and that they've been voiced in the, um, the, uh, the information, sorry, that's come forward um, on that perspective. Um, as we say, there's uh, considerations on the site as well with regard to the schools for the future. Um, again, I don't have detailed information behind the schools for the future. Um, process at this stage, but there, there have been discussions on an ongoing basis in this, uh, this area of Angus. Um, and the, the other concerns we have around the site itself is that there is the a funding group still in place around an athletics arena, and um, potentially on that that similar site. Um, and we just feel that needs to be taken into account in the wider context of looking at this this area um, as we move through as well. Um, certainly, the the benefits of the. Colin, you have one minute. Okay, no worries. The, the benefits of the proposal would certainly be that the pitch is badly in need of renovation. Um, that does need to be taken forward, and we believe we can take that forward, working with Angus Council and ourselves in close partnership with the school and also into the active schools team to ensure that the, the relationship is fostered and grows um, and develops wider into the local community um, and meets our strategic aims of encouraging participation for all and promoting a culture of diversity and quality. And our, our pricing structure um, does reflect the pricing that we have in place. We do have a new pricing structure for 2021, uh, which given the current situation hasn't launched um, in terms of the, the financial year that we're in. Um, but I would confirm that the, the pricing for the match um, activities were a two hour price and they always have been a two hour price with Angus Alive. Um, well, we have reviewed that and actually reduced that number quite considerably, that price to encourage teams to use our facilities for matches. Um, and that uh, Mr. Anson had brought up the Webster Sports Centre comparison they are there just to demonstrate the, the full range of prices that we operate with across Angus. Um, the synthetic charges um, out with Webster Sports Centre are in place across our other pitches at Brecon Community Campus and Forfar Community Campus. And we believe that gives us the um, equality of access and the equity of access across the whole area. Um, Can you wind up the access call facility. Please? Okay, yeah, in summary, um, we are very, very keen and very excited to have our both sports centre synthetic pitch as part of our a portfolio of, of operations as we move forward. We are very, very keen to, to keep it that way. We would love to see the pitch renovated and are keen to work with our colleagues, our client link into Angus Council to, to make this happen and link with the appropriate national bodies through Sports Scotland to try and take this forward. And also, I would re-emphasise at this point, work very closely with Skills Academy um, to maintain the positive relationship that we do have in the, in the Arbroath area and take that forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Colin. If you can just hang on, just, uh, I believe I will probably have some questions uh, from from members. Yeah, uh, no problem. 
Councillor Warren has his hand up. Councillor Warren. Yes, thank you, convener. Thank you, Colin. Uh, just a couple of quick points on that, and if you could maybe confirm, yep. you're saying that there's a long-term will to uh, renovate or, 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 or get this pitch back up to scratch. Why long term when it's been sitting like that for many years? I used to play on that four or five years ago, but it got dangerous then. Uh, and, and we always were a bit upset when we got thrown outside to play because the pitch was that bad. And I'm, I'm going back four or five years. Why do we have to sit and wait for a long term will on something that really, when it was identified years ago, should have been done by Angus Alive? And I know you'll say it's all to do with funding, but surely if there's a community... Uh, uh, group out there that's willing to fund us now, or certainly within the next 12 months to get things going. Is that not a better option to jump on? Thank you very much for your question. I, th I think the, in answer to that, the, the work has been carried out by the, the strategic commissioning function. I'll put my teeth back in when I say that. Um, in terms of Angus Council, and that work was carried out uh, actually prior to the community asset transfer um, application landing um, with Angus with uh, Angus Council. So the, 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 the cost things there on replacing the pitch have been there, but they were put on hold, I believe, from one of the uh, Angus Council Capital Project meetings uh, on the basis that the community asset transfer had come back in, or had, had arrived, sorry. So they were looking to reach an outcome on that before committing any other funding to the project. Now, I understand there's capital pressures on, on the council as anybody else um, at this stage, um, but that, that work had been carried out prior to any uh, community asset transfer application coming in. Uh, but we haven't at this stage carried out any public consultation with regard to that as, the, as that was put on hold with the, the community asset coming in. Yeah, it's just, it's just that I know from, from emails that I receive every now and again, quite, quite often actually, but not, not every week I mean, I'd, saying that, you know, it's a disgrace that our growth size of the town doesn't have a pitch facility, synthetic pitch facility for, for, for groups and football teams and rugby teams and, and, and whoever else that could utilise it. And it just seems to have, this has this dwindled on for years. I'm speaking four or five years ago that we stopped using that outdoor pitch because it was such a state. And, and, and I don't know if this is a position uh, convener that I could bring in Ian Lorimer just to clarify because I, I, I can't seem to remember us in a capital monitor or in a PBSG ever taking this out of the budget, did we? Is, is that something Ian Lorimer could answer for me just now or is that against what we call it? Well, we'll certainly ask him. I don't see any reason why not. Thank is, you. Uh, Mr Lorimer there? Yeah. yeah. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. You can. Yes. Thank you, convener. Yeah. The, um, the, the first I recall of a, of a bid in terms of replacement of the surface was through the most recent capital budget process. So for 2021, that would have been kicked off about this time last uh, last year. I think there was a, um, an ask around the replacement of, of two separate uh, surfaces. Um, I think that was the, the, the first, certainly, that I remember of a, of a, of a capital bid. Um, and as uh, Councillor, uh, sorry, as, as Mr Knight has um, mentioned, that was put on hold because there was the, the CAT application had come in and we needed to determine that uh, first of all. Thank you. Okay, that's me. Thanks, Kavina. Okay, we've got Councillor Whiteside. Thanks, Kavina. Um, yeah, I thought the, the report threw up quite a lot of questions. My first one was similar to Councillor Wan's. Um, it's, it's a bit worrying that the, the level of neglect and mismanagement over the years um, has, has got, got us to where we are now. And presumably, if the facility had been kept in good condition, the CAP application wouldn't have, have come about. Um, we're told on page 19 that there's no specific budget provision, well, no specific budget provision currently exists. So we don't have a commitment for that at this point in time, far less a commitment to um, build up a fund for future replacement. So that's a worry. One of the main um, arguments is the location, uh, against the, the bid is the location. However, correct me if I'm wrong, there's no proposals for any... Um, work on a new school that'll come up within the next 10 years at the, at the very least. So it seems it seems unfair on the people of Arbroath to put things on hold for something that may or may not happen from time in the future. Um, that was the that was the main points but the 
there's also safeguards in place for the Council on Angus' life should the bid go through, which are detailed at um, 6.2, and also quite a lot of conditions at 7.4. And one thing that occurred to me that could maybe alleviate the, the main problem about the school redevelopment, could we consider changing the, the purchase to a long-term lease, which has happened in other community asset transfers recently? If the, the, the lease for, was for something like 25 years, the community group would still be able to apply for funding. If we had a break clause, say after 10 years, that would coincide with the time when the pitch would need to be replaced and it would also give um, flexibility for the school redevelopment if need be. So I wonder if that could be considered along with the rest of the conditions at 7.4 and we could maybe get a compromise out to everybody. Thank you, Councillor Whiteside. Is there any further questions? No? Okay. Thank you, Colin. Um, we'll go to uh, Beth Reader from Education. Is Beth there? Yes, I am. Thank you, convener. Um, we'd just like to set out a little bit of information from um, the education perspective. I, I, I won't repeat the points that Colin has made, uh, really just to say that, that we are um, in, in agreement with his position and our view remains that the CAT application is not in the best interests of our service. Having discussed this with the head teacher on Friday, he has confirmed that th that is his position as well, that he does not support the application. Um, and, and I note that um, our director of education, Kelly McIntosh, was uh, part of a meeting but, but has advised that she was not supportive of the application um, at that time. The pitch, while it does require investment, um, in, in the view of the school is playable and it is used, it is timetabled, um, but, but we do know it does need investment um, and, and has not been well maintained, but it, it does still have uses. Um, and, and our view is that it remains the best interest of the council to remain an asset within our control. Um, particularly um, thinking longer term in our response um, to the need for flexibility for timetabling um, as we move forward in our recovery plans for education. We need to ensure that we have the best uses, use of space. Uh, as noted in our early response to the application, we at the time we did not feel that the proposals for school access um, were sufficient, although I do know um, from the deputation that there has been a shift on that, um, but our view would remain that we're not in support of the proposal. Okay, thank you, Beth. Is there any questions for Beth? The lucky person, Beth, no questions. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, colleagues, uh, I'm just going to open up for, uh, for com comments here. Uh, convener, um, Mr. Lorimer would like to just to speak here before uh, members go into any formal debate, please. Okay, thank you, Mr. Lorimer. Thank you again, uh, Convener. Just, just a couple of things, uh, one of which is a, a fairly technical thing. Um, really just to, to confirm that because if, if the CAT application was agreed, the council would be disposing of a piece of land at less than best consideration. And there's some legislative requirements that we need to meet in relation to that. Those include the carrying out of an appraisal um, to consider the financial implications, benefits and disbenefits, etc. Um, and that the disposal is reasonable um, in, on, those, uh, on those grounds as something that would promote um, improvement of economic development, health, social wellbeing, etc. It was simply to, to confirm that the, the CAT assessment process uh, takes those things into account. So that consideration of, of disposal at less than best has been covered as part of the, as part of the assessment. So really just to, to flag that for the, the committee's uh, information. Um, there's been a couple of a couple of questions, convener, that have come up through the the discussion, which I, I can probably answer if if that's if that's okay. Yes. yes. Councillor Moore had asked about why we should accept a cat for something that's not surplus. Um, the the position in terms of the legislation is such that um, an asset does not have to be surplus for uh, a cat application to be to be made and to uh, to, to be agreed. Um, Councillor Whiteside had asked about um, whether it could be changed to a purchase rather than a lease. We've, we've clarified this position since uh, more recent CATs um, and we would not be able to change uh, an application for uh, ownership to an application for lease. Effectively, it would have to be a resubmission as a, as a lease application for that to, for that to progress. 
Um, the other thing I think I would say is the in terms of the way that the report was written, it was obviously based on the CAT application that was made. Um, now that, because of a variety of, of circumstances, including the impact of delays because of, uh, of, of coronavirus, um, you've heard from Mr. Anderson, uh, things, have, things have obviously have changed in terms of what the, the, the Skills Academy offer would be in terms of school use and so forth. So I thought I should flag that the report was written on the basis of the application, uh, but you've heard some, some further updates to that as part of the, the deputation. Uh, and that's, that's me. Thanks, convener. Oh, okay. Thank you, Mr. Lorimer. Okay. Um, well, maybe I'll, right, uh, I'll start with the, right, uh, the, the, the comments. Um, having gone through the, the, the paper and uh, listened to um, the deputation and obviously Colin and Brett and Bet, when I was going through the paper, um, uh, I got to 3.3 and Regeneration, public health, social well-being, right, all, right, all jumped out and right at me. Um, would there be another proposal from the council on 3.4? Um, well, there has been. Um, and 3.5, um, would the, the transfer body be able to successfully deliver the, uh, the project and make it sustainable? Uh, and from, from what I've read through the report, uh, I must say I've been very I was very impressed with the business case, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Uh, um, and I believe um, from other, other colleagues that it's a very successful organisation. Um, I did note there were no right no ob right objections. Uh, I, I looked at the score right, the scoring, uh, albeit uh, it came out higher for uh, Angus right, Angus alive. Um, there was like, there was very like, there was very little uh, in that. Um, I looked at the operational considerations. Uh, uh, Mr. Anderson um, has said that they, they're quite happy to align with the current schedules. So that uh, that answered that question for me. Um, the change in facilities was a, like was a, like a worry in toilets, uh, and, and again that was answered regarding uh, port uh, uh, cabins uh, and, uh, and agreeing uh, agreeing pricing. Um, uh, also noted that that uh, the 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 cat um, had to be the, the the funding had to be prepared and agreed, uh, and Mr. Anderson said they would be quite happy to. Work with the council and agree a time scale for this. This actually right to 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 happen. Um, looking at the the officer's recommendations, albeit it says uh, that it would be recommended no and to work with Angus Alive if I've got it right. Yeah. Um, I think that is something that probably could happen, has been intimated by both parties, both Colin and Mark said they would still be uh, prepared to, to, to work. There was a, a will to invest uh, and there was a very good at the present time relationship with skills in the academy uh, and education, albeit education seemed to be not so keen right on, right on the idea. Uh, the views and recommendations. Um, I'm right, I'm looking at. Uh, it certainly couldn't go without any uh, any conditions, and the conditions I see from seven point four um, would cover virtually everything. So I believe we could get an agreement. Just because they're not unsurmountable, I agree with that. And there still seems to be a will for all parties to work together. However, this is, uh, I must say, this is a, a, a difficult one, and I would appreciate comments from my other colleagues before we, we take this forward. So, Councillor Wan. Thank you, convener, again. Can I just say, first of all, I'd like to state that I fully support this application. Our growth for many years has sweat without proper synthetic training pitches, something that I find a bit of a disgrace for the size of the town. 
many times since becoming a councillor, I've been asked to challenge the council to provide such a facility, but to no avail, which again, I can understand it comes down to finance. So it's, it's uh, you know, priorities uh, come, come before it, but it really is something that our growth has been crying out for. Now we have a chance to let a community group take this on with a little help from Angus Council, and I would urge from this committee to support it. I, I would like to consider option two with the conditions that the conveners just mentioned, uh, as, as uh, listed on 7.4, which I think Mark Anderson answered the majority of the questions on that anyway, and that there is a will to, to work together. Uh, but, but my plea to, to everybody on the SAC and the full council is to support this transfer on the basis of recommendation option two. Uh, and I, I hope that everybody makes the right decision. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Warren. Any further comments? No? Yep. Oh, oh Councillor Whiteside. Thanks, convener. Um, yeah, I, I, I tend to agree with Councillor Wan, given that we've been at, we've been told to make a decision based on the papers in front of us and based on the papers in front of us, the bid by Skills Academy um, appears much stronger. I appreciate there's several hurdles to overcome, but Mark Anderson has, has said he's willing to compromise and, and come to an agreement. The other thing I was going to query was the scoring. The scoring that gives a higher community benefit to the existing use, the papers don't back that up. It's very, very difficult to see where the score has come from um, when you compare the two, the two sides of the story. So I think based on the information we've got in front of us, I think the CAP application should go through um, option two. Okay, thank you, Councillor Whiteside. Uh, have we got any further comments? Councillor Moore. Thank you, Convener. Um, call me mercenary, but the report states that the land is worth forty to fifty thousand, and we're being offered a hundred pounds. I personally, while I can appreciate that it would be a benefit to our growth, I think that we should have been looking for more money. We're basically giving this away, and then we're going to pay to use it. Is the way I read it. I may be wrong, somebody can tell me I'm wrong, but that is what I'm seeing. So I find it difficult to support. Okay, thank you, Councillor Moore. Right, colleagues, I must say, right, the, this is a difficult one. Right, this is a difficult one, and uh, I've been over and over it. If you see the papers that I've got in front of me, right, virtually covered in in yellow for right for right for both. But I've listened to my two elected member right, colleagues who seem to be quite keen on this. Um I see what council what Councillor Moore has just said there. Yeah, a hundred pounds is that uh, seems a ridiculous amount of money for something that's been valued at 40k to 50k, but on saying that with the community benefit uh, and how much money is going to be spent on it, uh, i.e. 220k on a like on a new pitch, um, something that uh, the council certainly don't have like, like at the moment. Uh, I would certainly be worried that uh, given that this is such a good organisation uh, with a willingness to work with Angus Alive and and the council that we could bring forward uh, a proposal that would be absolutely stunning as far as I'm concerned um, uh, for, like, like for, our, like for our growth. Yeah, there's a lot of downsides to it, especially in the fact that um, uh, future use, uh, but I don't know what the future use would be unless we're going to make a bigger school. There's nothing coming forward like, like, regarding that. Um, but with a the benefit of the, uh, what has been put in front of us in the three phases, um, I'm inclined to agree with Councillor Warren and Councillor Whiteside. Um, what I would be recommending is uh, is option two, but 
with all the conditions um, that, the, that the officers have recommended. I don't know if there's anything else you would perhaps want to like to, to add to that. Uh, so I'll put that out again. Is there anything you would add? Or the officers feel that we think we would need to add? No? Councillor Vaughan? Yeah, can, can I just add that I, I, I totally agree with you there and, and, and get the conditions met. There has to be the transparency side of things. And if Angus alive, who are already saying that there's a relationship with skills and they're willing to work, I'm pretty confident that they can strike off all these conditions to an agreement. Uh, you know, and, and, and I'm sure skills, uh, I'm not wanting to speak on behalf of skills, but I'm pretty sure they are, they are uh, confident that they will be able to, to agree everything. And, and it's part of the condition anyway. So if, if there is no agreement and there's a stumbling block. So I think, I think it's pretty well covered in my opinion. Okay, you know, at this juncture, uh, Mr. Colin Knight has, has asked if he can uh, speak to the committee again in relation to the conditions. I know Mr. Knight's already spoken and we are in debate, but it'd be a matter for the committee if they wish to hear uh, Mr. Knight again. Well, I must say I would have no objections of Mr. Knight speaking again, but that's what the committee think, yes or no? Yeah. I, I, I have no objections, convener. Uh, would it maybe be uh, worthwhile asking Mr. Anderson to come back in as well? Because there was a couple of inferences made that he didn't have the go-ahead from the SFA and the SRU on funding, or I maybe picked up slightly wrong, but only in fairness, if that's okay. Yeah, I have no issues. The, the committee have no issues with that? No issues. Fine. Okay. Col Colin Knight, would you like to come back in, please? Yeah, thanks, Kevin, and thank you very much uh, for agreeing to the additional bit from myself. Um, I think in terms of the conditions, the if the, the cap was to go through, the only condition that we would like to see further and have further discussion with a uh, particular skills academy on would be the potential for um, access to the to any renovated surface that would allow us to complete particularly term time and holiday programs uh, particularly with young people in mind on, on this front um, but also um, access with regard to potential coach education courses whether that be particularly in football or in wider sports such as rugby I think you know the surface would be suitable for rugby to use um, if we could gain access and, and have some sort of agreement around that with regard to costings around that, because uh, that would obviously bring, from our perspective, what we try to do is obviously enhance the community benefit in there and also upskilling of potential workforces, etc., for for local clubs and potentially beyond. So that would be, I'm not 100% sure, but I think maybe within some of the wording of of some of the points at 7.4, it may be covered, but I think it may be just to be, be a wee bit more explicit in there in terms of that from our perspective. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mr Lormer, I mean, I've, I've just briefly put this uh, potential for access term and holiday courses, access and agreement right, for, right, for, right, for other, other, right, other sports, I think it was, it was said. Um, can that be covered in the, the conditions? Or would it, maybe not Mr Lormer I need to speak to, it would be Mrs Buchanan? Um. Convener, just to clarify, are these um, additional conditions on top of what's detailed in terms of the report? Mm -hmm. Yes, they are, sorry. We need to specify exactly what they were and just get, have the committee agree them. Okay. Uh, I would be looking at... Uh, I'm going to need the wording again uh, for, uh, from you. <laughs> Well, can you sit and do some wording for like, like what you would actually be looking for? Yeah, I, I think it's probably, uh, I'm just looking down the list here. Uh, it probably comes in around number four, which at the moment is agreement being reached with the Council, Angus Alive on how Skills Academy will ensure adequate community access and fair pricing will apply to usage of facilities. I think that one's focused on the pricing aspect. Yeah. I think potentially there's a, a similar wording around that, but focusing on access for, for Angus Alive and Angus Council as, as organisations, um, which would um, allow us to, I'm just trying to word it here as I go, provide enhanced community access and engagement or and benefit um, through activity, courses and 
it's maybe telling it as educational courses, which would take in coach education for us, which would maybe you know increase the, the skill set of the local community, become involved in their local clubs or the governing bodies or professional jobs um, at some point. Okay, if I was just to cut that, right, cut that down and just say an access for Angus Alive and Angus Council, right, uh, uh, as, as, as required in reason. It, I, I think it would come in, I think what it needs to do is just allow for that reasonable discussion to take place about how that access could happen and how that could operate moving forward. Okay. Would you be happy with that and access for Angus, right, Angus Alive and that Angus Council is required in reason? So that right, so there's a discussion regarding that uh, uh, condition? Yeah. Okay. Um, Mark Anderson, do you want to come back in? Uh, I believe Councillor Warren had a, um, he, he thought maybe something had been missed. Yeah, sure. Um, so in terms of SFA, we spoke to, I'll just get this correct, the Scottish Football Partnership, which is a, a branch of the SFA in terms of community funding, charity-based stuff. Um, and that's who the port -the cabin facilities um, come from. And as I say, we've had discussion with them. They seem confident we'd hit the criteria for them. Um, but obviously until we had the facility, that wasn't something we could progress fully. Um, and in terms of the rugby, uh, we spoke to Andy Cummings um, several times. He was actually there when we did a, a launch of this, as you like. You know, he was in one of the, the photographs from the Evening Telegraph. He was uh, somebody from Scottish Rugby was there. We spoke to them in great detail. What they actually initially wanted was the pitch to be extended so they could use it for matches. However, the length of the current pitch isn't feasible for rugby matches, hence the reason it could only be used for training matches. Obviously, extending the length was going to be a lot bigger project. It wasn't something they felt we could do at that time. Um, so, yeah, we have had regard, uh, numerous discussions. Um, in terms of funding, nobody's committed any funding. I said that clearly in my, my, my deputation. However, there is discussion that if access could be made by the rugby, that there could be pockets that Andy could direct us to in terms of uh, access and some of that. Um, and in terms of, you know, Colin from Angus Alive, I uh, absolutely agree, you know, for a good working relationship so far with some of the facilities that skills use. Um, term time and holiday programmes, coach education, absolutely things we can discuss and hopefully come to some form of agreement on. Um, and absolutely see no reason why we couldn't work together on this. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mark. Thanks. And uh, Mr. Lorimer would like to speak at this point. Okay, Mr. Lorimer. Thank you again, convener. Yeah, depending on the, the, the committee's decision, if the committee were, were minded to approve the application, it was really just the flag that that is, that is step one on a process. That does not conclude the CAT application. There's then a a process of legal agreements that would need to be drawn up and um, the conditions that the committee's been debating would obviously be part of that. Uh, it's written down on half a page in the report and um, it, it would obviously be quite a bit of discussion to make that happen in, uh, happen in practice. Um, but that though all of those things can be captured in uh, a suitable legal agreement between the Council and uh, Skills Academy to, to tie all those things, uh, all those things together, including the the additional suggestion from uh, from Mr. Knight that would all be subject to to further uh, discussion and I, I I think negotiation. There are also um, other conditions that go along as part of a cat transfer that the committee has already ag agreed in policy terms. Things like the 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 the, uh, the, the applicant in this case Skills Academy would uh, obviously be responsible for the upkeep and all of those type of things would be would be part of that. Um, so it was really just a flag that this is step one in a, in a, in a process. Thank you, Mr. Lorimer. Okay, this is step, right, is, is step one. Um, I'm, right, I'm going to move uh, option two. Councillor, uh, uh, convener, Councillor White, like Councillor Warner oh, has indicated oh, the way to speak. your pardon, I didn't, didn't notice that. Uh, Councillor White, say. Hello, um, thanks convener. Um, just in light of what um, Mr Lorimer said um, re regarding not being able to consider a long-term lease, if there was any uneasiness about going ahead at this point, another option would be to defer the decision and explore the possibility of the long-term lease um, 
that's just another another option if there was any um, uneasiness about it. I think in general the 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 proposal is supported. Um, it's just how how we go about doing it. Okay, uh, I, I get your point, uh, Councillor Whiteside. But this is this has actually been I believe it's been uh, deferred twice. Um, so really, I think it's uh, time that we like, we we'll, we'll move forward with it. So uh, let's just go ahead with uh, like, uh, a decision today. Councillor Wan. Uh, Councillor Wan. Yeah, sorry, convener. I should have asked this a little bit earlier, but it, it, it's maybe too late. But is there any specific steps that is going to be taken to cater for disability at games, football games for disabled, or wheelchairs, etc.? Also, port a cabin for access. It was just really a quick question on that one. If that can be answered. Yeah. Um... We have had initial discussions, uh, very initial. Um, Councillor Speed, who I'm sure you all know, um, it was very long time ago. It's something we would touch base in, um, in terms of disability access. As I say, we want this to be for the community, every single member of the community. Um, so those are things we will take into account when we're planning access to the Arso and the changing rooms particularly. Um, appreciate the port of cabins won't be the biggest facilities, but it's certainly something we'll take on board when we're making that application. Yeah, absolutely, they're in our focus, and it has been something we've had very tentative and initial discussions a while back when this process started. Um, the lowest speed, who actually came down and came to some of the skills programs and had a look at what we were doing. Um, so, yeah, we have had a few discussions, and it's something that certainly she said she could signpost us to various organisations uh, in terms of progressing that. Okay, thank you. That, that's very important, uh, and I would actually like to, like to add that into it. Like one of the agreements, like the agreements if, I, if I can get my colleagues to agree, I've put down number um, for number eight, agreement that disability access and toilets are included. Would that be agree agreeable? Agreed. Yeah. Uh, going back... Convener, my apologies. Um, Mr. Knight is again asked to to speak. Um, I'm not sure if, if the committee would wish to do that. And, and also, I would say at this point that I think there need to be clarification for, uh, through yourself, Chair, in terms of what the committee is actually agreeing, because we are we are changing or revising a number of conditions, and we need to be clear that all members are clear as to what the committee is is ultimately trying to achieve. Okay. Right. Right. Thank you, Mr. McCaskill. Um, as I say, I was going to move option two, right, with the conditions on 7.4, um, two, uh, two of them still to be agreed, which would be number four and, uh, and number eight. Um, is that agreed by the committee? Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Mr. McCaskill, is it just a matter of like, agreeing a wording for the, the two conditions that I've said, four and eight? I think that would be a matter that I think that uh, legal and finance we would need to be involved in, but if we're clear that the application has been approved. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And the, the deputation of Mr. Anderson is clear that that is the case, um, then we can conclude the matter at this moment. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. McCaskill. Uh, Mr. Anderson, are you quite happy with what we've said, like what we've what we've said and what we've agreed today? Yeah. So just to clarify, sort of phase step one's been agreed then by the committee with view of those conditions being met and discussions with Angus Alive Council, etc. Yes. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much, guys. Appreciate your okay. time. Thank you. Okay. We can. Uh, yeah, you can you can go now, Mr. Okay. Anderson. Please. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> you know, just uh, I'm just waiting for Councillor Duff to be uh, allowed back into the, the meeting room. But I I understand from um, IT host that that he's left. Um, but I just want to confirm if Councillor Duff is still in the lobby before we proceed to the next next item. Okay, thank you. <coughs> I think I'm back in. Okay. Oh. <laughs> right, we'll move on. Uh, item four, it's uh, a, a motion by Councillor Fairwell, that being right myself. Um, uh, the motion is 
it is proposed to remit officers to explore the possibility of granting one day of special leave for Angus Council employees in recognition of the amazing work they have undertaken throughout the pandemic. pandemic. I really can't say um, enough about the Council, from the officers to all the staff, every single member of staff and their partners, uh, the work that they have done to keep Angus, uh, Angus Council uh, uh, running, I would say, extremely smoothly. Uh, I think it's to be, it's to be commended. Um, that's why this motion is in front of you. Um, obviously, there are details that still have to, uh, have, have to be uh, gone through, uh, i.e. for education, to see how we, uh, how we can do this. Um, uh, but I, what I ask is that you support uh, that motion today. And if you've got anything to say on the motion, please, please do so. I do have a seconder. I believe Councillor Duff is going to second me. Yes, Leader, I, I'm quite happy to, to second you on behalf of the, the SNP group. I think, as you've said, it's we're living in extraordinary times, and I think the staff have certainly risen to the challenge. I think not only people doing their own jobs, but perhaps doing a new or different job like the Heart Centre, like the uh, benefit people dealing with with, uh, with company grants and stuff like that. So very happy to, to, to support you. It's a very small token of our of our um, appreciation for the, all the efforts of the staff in these very difficult times. Thank you, Councillor Duff. Is there any right, Councillor Whiteside? Thanks, convener. I would, of course, echo what, both what yourself and Councillor Duff have said. I think everybody um, everybody here would uh, really appreciate all the hard work that's going in. Of course, one problem that might come up is when, when officers are so busy, it's difficult even using flexi time, far less extra holidays. So I just wonder if the council have considered any further flexibility around deadlines for using flexi and holiday, um, holiday dates at this time? I'm unsure, but I'm sure that through the, uh, the remit to officers, with anything can be explored, Councillor Whiteside? Just quickly, Councillor Fairbrother, that, that's that's already in place. We did take a decision to extend the periods for Flexi and staff have been utilising that, that have been working longer hours. Thank you, Mrs Williamson. Okay, we've got, Councillor Moore, have you got a comment? Yeah, just to say I agree with everybody. I would hope that, if necessary, we allow the day's holiday to be carried into the next council year, if it can't be used before then. They deserve the day. If they can't get it in this year, let's carry it forward for them. Thank you, Councillor Moore. Any further comments? Yes. Councillor Wan? Yeah, thank you, Convener. I would just like to echo everybody's sentiments there and thank the staff for everything they've done. I'll speak on behalf of the, uh, or to my education department, especially, who have worked extremely hard, helped me out to answer questions back to my constituents because this has been one of the biggest concerns is about getting the children back to school or, or or what we've done for the last three months for them to ensure education has, has continued along similar paths to what's in the past, even though it's homework. And so thank you very much for that. And uh, I, I, I totally agree with the, the motion. Thank you. Thank you. Is the motion agreed? Agreed. agreed. Thank you. Now, I, I, my apologies here. I, I think I'm going goggle live with the amount of papers that I've, that, that I've got sitting in front of me. I did miss out the, 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 the minute of the previous meeting. Um, so I'll just do that now. Um, it can also be noted that Councillor Devine has asked that the minute of Article 9 be amended so it reads, Councillor Devine expressed concern at the lack of transparency and the non-involvement of the SNP with the Economic Recovery Group. Now, I'm not quite understanding what part of transparency uh, she was not sure of, um, because I did uh, uh, call uh, Councillor Devine uh, and let her know what the administration were thinking of doing with an initiative uh, for the Economic Recovery Group. However, that is what she did say, if I remember rightly, at the meeting, so I'm agreeable to this. So I asked the committee to agree the minute subject to this correction. Is that agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Okay. Salmon wishes to speak, convener, in relation to the minute. Yes. Yeah, thanks, convener. 
I was looking to seek clarification of item 10, the Money Feath Resource Centre, namely recommendation 4. Um, while, I believe, while I believe recommendation 4 minutes the intention of the committee, having reviewed the YouTube film of the meeting, the committee actually never made any decision on the rental of the land. So through you, convener, I'd seek some guidance from Mr McCaskill on how we could move this forward. Thank you, Councillor Salmond. Uh, Mr McCaskill, can you help here? I would hope to assist, convener. Yes, I, I did note, uh, as did Councillor Salmond at the minute, did indeed record that the committee had agreed to a peppercorn rent. I, had, I also did review the recording of the meeting and the actual decision of the committee on that part of the report was not clear. However, my view is that whilst the committee did not explicitly state this, it was the intention of the committee to agree a peppercorn rent. I would therefore ask the committee through you chair that for the avoidance of doubt, the committee today confirms this was indeed the decision of the meeting on the 26th of May. Yeah, thank you, Mr. McCaskill. Um, well, I agree with it. Right? I agree with that. I do believe that was the decision of the committee yep. on that day. Is that agreed? Agreed. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Salmon, for bringing that to our attention. Okay, we we'll move to item number six. You know, uh, Councillor yep. Whiteside has has her hand oh. up to speak. Oh, oh Councillor Whiteside, sorry. Sorry, convener, me again. It was just also a minor point on item number 10 on PG. Just the, the title again of the Monifeath Community Resource Group was um, was wrong on the report. We raised that at the meeting at the time, and it's it's also wrong in the minutes. So um, it should it should read Monifeath Community Resource Group, and it reads Monifeath Resource Community Group. Something like that. It's just, uh, it's just an anarchy to say that I wanted to bring up. Thanks. Can we have that corrected, Clark, please? Yes, can we? We'll do that. Lovely. Thank you. Okay. Third time lucky for number six. Um, that's the Angus Council COVID-19 dashboard uh, development. I must say, right, when I looked at that, I thought it was absolutely excellent. You've got the, the recommendations uh, in front of you. Uh, are there any questions? Councillor Duff has indicated Yeah, thanks. Thanks, convener. Uh, and I thought this was the most appropriate place in the agenda to ask this, this question. I really got a one, I've got a comment and a question. I'll, I'll give you the comment first. Certainly, um, it's really in relation to business grants and very much like to thank um, Mr. Lorimer's team in finance with a couple of um, grants to small sports um, organisations in Angus. Um, we appreciate that the, the government guidance has changed over the last few weeks and, and that's, uh, that's been good news for both of them. I guess my question is about business support for motor trade businesses. Um, I, I've got some information which indicates that the I'm not sure what we have given, we have granted in Angus, but I think the suggestion is other councils have interpreted the regulation slightly differently. Um, and, and if you go to the finance circulator, circular 08, it, 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 there's a huge list of, of types of businesses that are supported, but they include uh, car washes, um, higher depots for, for cars, and workshops and sh showrooms. Now, there's, the issue seems to be whether they are deemed to be retail or service, and it's a kind of fine point. Um, there's um, a communication I've seen from Fife Council to the Chief Executive of the Scottish Motor Trade Association, which in indicates that Fife have allowed um, grants to coach builders, accident repairers, and firms that supply tyres, exhaust, brakes, etc. So, it does seem to be a slightly grey area, and I would certainly like to ensure that businesses in Angus are getting the appropriate level of support from, from the scheme within, obviously, us abiding by the, the government rules. Thank you, Councillor Duff. Um, I note the report was written by Andrew Carr. I don't think Andrew's here today, is he? Can, uh, is there anybody can... Uh, Reply back to Councillor Duff. Yes, convener. Ian Lorimer can comment on the specifics of the business grants. Thank you. Mr Lorimer. Yeah, thank you, convener, and thank you, Councillor Duff, for, for, for the question. Um, 
we look at each um, uh, the guidance. The guidance, as Councillor Duff has, has said, has changed um, almost on a weekly basis since since the inception, and that's obviously to deal with um, changes in circumstances, gaps in the in, in, in the original uh, proposals. We look at each in individual application um, on its own on its own merits. It depends on eligibility, depends on the, the specific circumstances of the of the business. Um, as Councillor Duff has highlighted, sometimes that can mean quite careful judgment uh, uh, about the, the, how we interpret the, the, the guidance and how we apply it. Um, I can say that we, we, we've used discretion on a number of occasions where we feel that that's the right thing to do. Um, we know that the overriding principle of the, the scheme is to try and support uh, local businesses and the local economy, so that, that, that's what we've done. And I think we're up to virtually 19 million in terms of uh, money that's, that's been paid out so far. Um, where it becomes um, uh, difficult or tricky for us in terms of interpretation is where a business has uh, more than one um, type of provision. So you might have uh, a business that has a service as well as retail, and we need to look at what is the predominance uh, of the, of the, the, the provision. Um, I'm more than happy to, to pick up any specifics that, that Councillor Duff uh, is, is aware of um, and look at those. Any business that's been declined, a uh, 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 business grant that have applied, there is an appeal process and a review process. And I do know that a number of initial decisions have been changed when following that review process. So that, that is a, a robust process which can be looked at. I, I hear what Councillor Duff says in relation to Fife. We need to make the decisions that we think are the right uh, for, for Angus, but of course, we, I, I've seen the, the, the letter, I'm aware of it, uh, in terms of the, the decisions that Fife have made. We're, st we're using the same guidance and we will apply the guidance um, uh, the, the way that we think it needs to be interpreted. Um, but I know that we've, we've supported a number of businesses uh, connected to the motor trade. But as I say, if there's any specifics that, that Councillor Duff is aware of and wants us to look at that we're more than happy to look at those. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Lorimer. Does that help, Councillor Duff? Yeah, that, that's helpful. I think there might be some, uh, maybe communicate with Mr. Lorimer after after the meeting. Lovely, thank you. I believe uh, Councillor McMillan Douglas wants to come in. Yes, convener, thank you very much. I also want to pick up on the tremendous work being done to uh, provide uh, 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 lifeblood really to some of our businesses. Um, over the, the, the last three months, uh, the, these grants have provided the lifeblood to many businesses throughout Angus, which have seen their revenues fall over a cliff as customers have disappeared. It has been heartbreaking for those struggling to keep their businesses going and terrifying for their employees who have seen their incomes become dependent upon the furlough scheme or cease altogether. Uh, Angus Council announced at our meeting on the 3rd of April that we would act quickly by reaching out to help businesses, their employees, as well as council house rent payers and council taxpayers who were in acute need. Thanks mainly to an estimated £10 billion paid by the UK Government to the Scottish Government in special COVID funding, we and Angus Council have been able to make grants to local businesses adding up to some 18.8 million pounds, plus another 270,000 pounds in self-employed hardship grants. So as Mr. Lorimer has just said, over 19 million pounds in total has been paid to local businesses to keep them and their employees going through these very tough times. In addition, we acted quickly to ensure that our own council suppliers were paid promptly to help their cash flow and we are working hard to try and ensure that we expand the proportion of our suppliers who use local labor from the present 37%. So many businesses have approached me as I'm sure have approached others uh, to help, help uh, get this money. And I'm hugely appreciative of the uh, members of staff who moved from other jobs uh, to make this scheme the success that it has been in very difficult circumstances. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. Thank you, Councillor McMillan-Douglas. Uh, Councillor Whiteside? 
this convener. Um, yeah, I also welcome this report. It's a useful tool. There's a lot of um, really interesting information there. There was just one I wanted to pick up. Um, there, there's a bit of a gap between the number of applications received and the number awarded, both for business grants, but in particular for self-employed hardship fund. Uh, and it's just a concern there that some people are slipping through the gaps and not um, getting any support at all. I wonder if there's a if there's any sort of trend as to why these grants have been refused and whether people are being signposted towards additional help. Thank you, Councillor Whiteside. Is there anybody can help with that one? Well, it's still the same question. I think we're still focusing on business grants. And um, so it would be Mr Lorimer again. Mr Lorimer. Yeah, thank, thanks, convener. Um, the self-employed hardship grants are administered by, by colleagues in economic development who, who, who maybe, I don't know if there's anybody on the call that, that can help from, from that service. The, the eligibility criteria for the self-employed grants are really quite, quite um, uh, tight. So there, there's likely to have been a number of applicants that have, have applied but don't quite meet all of the, uh, all of the criteria. Um, we are, as part of our overall support arrangements, trying to point people to other forms of support, be that in terms of welfare benefits or, or other, uh, other avenues of, of support. And as I mentioned to, to the, the, the question that was raised earlier, the guidance has continued to, to change and adapt uh, to try and widen the, the scope of, of who's eligible. So I don't expect further changes in that particular area, um, but we are, we are doing uh, as much as we can to, uh, to, to provide support where the, the eligibility criteria aren't, aren't met. Thanks. Can, we, can I just say, I was going to say this at the beginning, that um, you know, this is all the information that we have collected and collated for government, for COSLA, for some professional associations. Um, what would be useful in terms of feedback, and Councillor Whiteside's points are a really good one, is any key areas that members would like further exploration of um, and we can do that and bring that detail either to scrutiny and audit committee because it is actually about our performance or bring it back as part of our next report because I am conscious that you know a number of uh, these graphs are new to members and they cover a wide range of things so if there's more detail about specifics that members are looking for we're happy to take that feedback and bring back uh, an alternative report or a more detailed report including either to um, full council or um, scrutiny and audit when we meet again. Thank you, Mrs. Williamson. That's that, that's helpful. Does that help, Councillor Whiteside? Yeah, thanks very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, you've got the re the recommendations in front of you. One is to scrutinise and two is to note. Is the, is the report agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Move on to number seven. With the financial resilience support and policy for people, business, and key suppliers, uh, propose, right, proposed revisions. The reports by Director of Finance uh, Ian Lorimer. Uh, you've got the recommendation uh, recommendations in front of you. Are there any questions? No questions, comments, and uh, Councillor Angus McMillan Douglas. Yes, thank you, convener. Um, the very useful paper. This paper notes that it is time to start weaning our citizens and key suppliers off grants of taxpayers' money as the economy is hopefully starting out on a road to recovery. My personal view is that as businesses and employees should be encouraged back to work so the, the economy restarts, wages can be paid and public services can be financed. Angus Council, through our economic recovery programme, is committed to assisting this process where we can. This paper recommends that we follow the Scottish Government policy of providing a transition from the present financial support for key suppliers to ending this at a point in the future. We support this so long as some tight caveats are followed. These are, in the case of Angus Health and Social Care Partnership providers, Reasonable, afford, uh, reasonable additional costs are met by the Scottish Government. Secondly, in all cases, the measures must be affordable to Angus Council. The affordability test is that the support must come from existing budgets. Failing this, it must come 
from additional government funding and failing this, a maximum of £100,000 can come from Angus Council General Fund. Finally, the policy remains subject to periodic review. Subject to these tight and professional rules, we support this clear transitional policy. Thank you, Convener. Thank you, Councillor McMillan Douglas. Uh, Councillor Moore. Thank you, Convener. Just two things. I was surprised by the short notice on this report. We're talking about starting it a week tomorrow, which was a little bit brief. But the only other item is in Appendix 1, Item 1, it says that we're going to start recovery action. Now, a lot of people have been hit hard by COVID-19. A lot of people have serious difficulties. And one of the things that I find that councils do is when they send out their standard letter, it's a demand. Can we look at the style of address? Because this is unprecedented circumstances. And can we talk to the people rather than talk at them? Thank you, Councillor Moore. Perhaps Mr Lorimer would like to comment. Thank you, Convener. In terms of the short notice, yeah, that's really just a product of the uh, the, the, the timing of, of, of committees. The, the uh, Special Council back in April agreed to suspend for three months to the end of June. Um, so this is really just about um, confirming what the position would be uh, after the 30th of, of June. Um, I, I entirely hear Councillor Moore's points around the, the sensitivity that needs to be applied to the restart of recovery action. Um, we've tried to bring that out in Appendix 1. Restarting recovery action is a package of measures and it needs to be seen as a, as a package. We've looked at the wording of our reminder letters. We've amended those. And our initial batch of reminder letters will also include a flyer for people to contact us, um, a number and email uh, contact, uh, sorry, not email contact, website contacts um, for people that need uh, additional help and support. Um, my, only, my only caveat on that is that um, I'm a little bit nervous about the scale of uh, workloads. So we're going to phase the reminder letters to try and manage that. But we do expect our phone lines to be uh, quite busy and we would want people to, to bear with us. The most important thing is if, if, if people are struggling, or businesses are struggling to, to make payments, is to get in touch with us. That way we can um, uh, make a payment arrangement. We can also check about eligibility for entitlement to things like council tax reduction or other benefits. Um, so we can, we can cover a lot of things if people get in touch with us. Um, but the intention is to restart recovery in a, in a, a sympathetic uh, basis, mindful of the circumstances that we have. I hope that provides some reassurance, Convener. I'm sure it does. Thank you for that, Mr Lorimer. Um, move to Councillor Duff. Yeah, thanks, Convener. Yeah, I'm quite reassured to hear um, Mr Lorimer's words there. And it's obviously quite difficult trying to balance at this point in time when we're moving hopefully slowly into recovery um sort of our prudence and what's affordable with a bit of compassion and a little bit of flexibility and i know the hundred thousand pound pot that that's available for if you like special cases or whatever so uh, yeah i welcome the report and um reassured by what mr lorimer has said thank you councillor duff okay any further comments or no, okay, you've got the recommendations uh, in front of you. I'm not going to read them all out because you've got them, but uh, one is notes, two is notes, and the second part of it is and delegates authority, three is approves, and the second part is and delegates authority, four is approves, five approve, and six is notes. Is the report agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Okay, we go to number eight. Uh, that's COVID-19. It's the update on the financial implications and change programme. Uh, the report is uh, again by the Director of Finance, Ian, Lor uh, Ian Lorimer. Uh, and I'll go to questions first. Um, you've got the recommendations. So any questions? Councillor Duff. 
Yeah, thanks, convener. And I think just if I can say so, a very excellent, useful report. I had a couple of specific questions, I think, for Mr Lorimer. Um, a wee bit of detail on 10.1, the special repayment of debt. Uh, and then if we can move to Appendix 2, which is the, the change plan, and the, the, the three items I, I could see that where our change savings are not as large as we had thought, I think procurement, agile and service reviews, a little bit of detail behind why these items were, were, were not going to be, um, not going to yield us as much savings as we had thought. Mr Lorimer. Yeah, thank you, uh, convener. 10.1, um, the, the special repayment of, of debt, uh, it's in relation to the vehicle replacement uh, program. Um, and, and really what we're doing there is we're deferring making that payment to give ourselves a little bit of flexibility should we need it um, in terms of addressing the, the financial challenges caused by COVID. Uh, in practice, we would normally make that, that payment at the 31st of March. Um, once, once that's been made, that's kind of locked in in terms of a repayment schedule. Uh, deferring it now gives us flexibility should we, should we need that. But if we don't need that, we can still go back and make the, make the repayment as effective on the 1st of April. So effectively, we really lose no, no time and no benefit. So it's a bit of a um, um, financial diligence to make sure that we, that we uh, give ourselves as much flexibility as we, as we can. Uh, given the unprecedented challenges that we face in the current financial year uh, on our budget, as they are outlined in the, in the report. Um, if I go on to the, to the appendix, Councillor Duff's asked about, I think it was procurement agile and, and service reviews. Um, procurement, um, I've probably taken quite a cautious view about what that programme of work will deliver. This is the collaboration project with, with the other councils in, in Tayside. Um, I'm a bit nervous about what the, uh, our supply chain uh, might be impacted by COVID, what the impact of that might be on, on prices. Um, and so we're, uh, we're being a bit cautious in terms of what we think the, that savings program will deliver. We still think it can deliver benefit. We're, we're still intent on delivering the, the, the collaboration, um, but we just think the economic, economic environment and the assumptions that uh, underpin the original um, savings target Things have changed, so um, we're, we're simply reflecting that within the, the change programme numbers. I think within six months we'll be able to review that again. We'll have a better idea of what the impact on the supply chain has been. We'll have a better impact on what's happened in terms of costs. And if there is the opportunity to increase that savings target again, then that's, that's what we would do. Um, in terms of Agile, it's really just a, an impact of the, uh, uh, the, the COVID-19 uh, related lockdown. So we're still expecting to deliver the same uh, value of savings over the three year period, but the phasing of that delivery is, has, has changed. So there's a bit of slippage from the current financial year into, into subsequent years, but we're still expecting to deliver the, the same total value. So that's really a slippage one just caused by lockdown. Uh, and then the last one in terms of service reviews, um, we've just had another look at what we think might be deliverable there, again, based on the, the impact on, uh, of, of, of COVID-19, the diversion of officer time onto, onto other tasks. That particular programme is still to be worked up in detail. So again, we're being, I would say, realistic, but still cautious about what we think that programme can, can deliver. And hopefully that answers the questions. Thank you, Mr Lorimer. To answer the questions, Councillor Duff. Yeah, thanks, Convener. Just, just to come back on one point, on, on item 8, um, the 10.1, the repayment of debt, am I right in saying that the regular £1 million which we repay, that, that's still been done and we're holding off the, the extra 700000 which is the relating to vehicle purchase? Yeah, thanks again through you, Convener. Yes, there's, there's three elements to it. There's, there's a, a standard million that we, which we build in and we, we've made that repayment this year. Um, there's, there's a lot of things uh, tied into to doing that. So we've done that. There's 776,000, I think it is, in terms of the vehicles which we've deferred. And then there's another sum of, I think it's a million and 42, uh, which is uh, earmarked for um, funding of the capital programme in the current year. Um, so that, that's, that's been earmarked for that purpose. Thank you, Mr. Lorimer. 
Okay, we'll move to comments. I know Councillor McMillan, McMillan Douglas wishes to speak. Yeah, thank you very much, Convener. Um, I, may I echo Councillor Duff's uh, comments that this is an extremely useful paper um, and uh, uh, something which I think we will all benefit from. Uh, also, on the point about uh, deferring the repayment of this particular debt that we had identified in the budget, that seems prudent and we're asked specifically to agree to that and I would certainly wish to agree to it. My overall point would be that we cannot tackle challenges unless we are honest and transparent about the potential scale of those challenges. This paper is honest and transparent. The very fact that we have this paper makes the overcoming of the challenges more likely. So many thanks to the Director of Finance and the whole management team for this. Work on updating budgets for the rest of this financial year will start shortly, as is noted in the paper. Um, we must be clear about our strategic objectives and try and embrace the best way of working so that we can achieve these objectives in the most effective way. The work that we com commissioned in February's budget uh, to study improved service delivery now looks even more relevant and will assist in this. But perhaps our greatest asset in moving forward is our success in managing huge improvements in efficiency over the past three years so that we have an experience of success to build on. Um, one final point uh, that I wish to make is that there will be many uh, suggestions of what will happen in the future and many of them will be proved wrong or only partially right. But one thing I am convinced of, that we must adhere to tight cost control. We must continue to treat council money as if it were our money. If we do this, it will open up opportunities as the future becomes clearer, which it will. Thank you, convener. Thank you, Council McMillan Douglas. Are there any further comments? No further comments? Okay, we have the, the recommendations. One is notes, two notes, three reviews and scrutinises, four is notes and five is agree. Is the report agreed? Agreed. agreed. Thank you. Okay, report number nine uh, is the COVID-19 meetings arrangements, update and proposed changes. Uh, I'm sure this will bring a smile to uh, a lot of people's uh, faces. You have the, the, the recommendations uh, in front of you, so um, uh, any comments? I'll, I'll go to uh, Councillor Duff. No, no questions first, please. Any questions? Councillor Duff, you got a question? Um, well, I, I possibly had a question. I'd like to make a comment, but I think, I think the question I would have is um, we are getting better at remote meetings, but I, I guess there are still some one or two IT issues which certain members have got. I mean, I know that uh, Councillor Moore has had a fix for his poor connectivity and that seems to be working well. Um, but I think possibly the, the home working arrangements for, I know it's being looked at for officers, but there may be issues with councillors and a little bit of simple uh, mods to our Surface Pros might allow us to hook them up to TV sets so we can read all those spreadsheets that we love. Um, without straining our eyes too much. But yeah, um, I think possibly we just need to be aware that, that there needs to be a bit of perhaps a little bit of improvement there. I think there's been good progress made, but we're possibly not there yet. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. Um, I must say I was, I'm totally surprised that uh, if somebody had said to me that two, three years ago that I'd be sitting in front of a computer do, um, chairing a committee, um, I would have probably laughed. Um, but uh, it has worked very well. Yeah, we have had some blips, um, but uh, incredible the, the work that we've managed to do right, uh, uh, in the fact that we've, we're doing it remotely. Um, Councillor Whiteside, have you got a question? Yes, uh, I do. Um, I welcome this report and I'm, I'm very pleased that the full council is going to be involved from August onwards, uh, albeit remotely. I'm a little bit wary about the um, fact that we're going to review this in six months' time. I would like to leave that a little bit more open so that we could um, explore the possibility of hybrid meetings, perhaps, 
Um, I appreciate there's some difficulties, but I don't think they're completely insurmountable. And it might be useful to uh, give members the choice and officers the choice of being there in person or um, joining remotely. So if possible, I would like that to be open so that we can review it sooner if, if possible. Thank you, Councillor White, White said. I'm, I'm sure the officers will, right, will, will look at that and if, if required, we'll bring, they'll bring back another report. Would that be okay? Right, thank you. Uh, Councillor, uh, Councillor Moore, is it a question, Councillor Moore? Yes, it, I may have missed it, but reading through this report, which I thought was wonderful, um, there is no reference to public access to the meetings. I know we had the, the problems in April, but are we go saying that we're going to continue just recording and putting on YouTube, or are we looking at allowing public access to meetings in the future? I and I can respond to that. Thank, right, thank you, Mrs. Williamson. Uh, I mean, as things stand at the moment, um, the only way we can do the online meetings is by recording and putting them immediately online. Um, there isn't a source other than Zoom, which we know has been breached before, that um, allows us to admit other people. So that would be the intention while we continue to hold remote meetings. And given that the public um, are not allowed to speak at these meetings, um, I think that's quite a good compromise for us to be taking at this stage. Thank you. Okay, I'll move to comments. I'm sure there'll be two or three comments. Councillor Duff. Yeah, thanks, Kevina. Yeah, really just to follow on from, from Councillor Whiteside's point, um, yeah, accepting where we are at the moment that the remote meetings, um, certainly in the short term, probably make most sense. Um, I think I'd like to see us moving towards the hybrid model in the, what I could call maybe the medium term. Um, I think the, the advantage of going to the hybrid model might be that might be the new norm. I mean, uh, there's been lots of debate in previous years about the best time for meeting, the difficulty that people who have uh, who've jobs attending council meetings, that may allow people to um, either attend in person or attend um, remotely. And that might be a good way for the future anyway. Uh, there are some members who may decide that they prefer not to travel uh, for whatever reason. So. I would like to see our ambition go towards a hybrid meeting at some point when it's safe, when it's affordable. I appreciate we may have to, we may have difficulties identifying um, a location. And I suppose we have to see how the, the school restart works, what facilities we need for that. And then we might be able to have a better idea what might be available for or if you like council meetings because I think we all know that the chamber is is not suitable and arguably there's other uh, maintenance issues with the chamber at the moment. Okay thank you Councillor Duff. Uh, are there any further comments? I don't see anything. No? Okay you've got the recommendations in front of you. One is agrees, two agrees, three notes, four notes and five notes. Is the report agreed? Agreed. 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 Sorry, convener. Convener, sorry to interrupt. Um, I'm a bit confused about recommendation two. If we, if we agree recommendation two today, then it will be reviewed in six months' time. So if that's what's been agreed, that's fine. But I just ah. need to be clear on that point. Um, well, Councillor Whiteside did suggest, I think Councillor Whiteside suggested a bit longer than that. Councillor Whiteside, can you come back in? Um, yeah, no, I, I didn't want um, us to be fixed to six months. If it was possible sooner to have hybrid meetings, I just wanted it to be a little bit more flexible than that. So, Convener, what I'm asking is, are we changing that recommendation um, or are we agreeing the recommendation as it stands? It's just to be clear for, for the minute, because we, we know from the beginning of this meeting there's one or two bits that what we're uncertain about from the previous meeting. I just wanted to be clear on that point. Okay. I see where I see where you're coming from, but six right, six months sounds fine to me. Can we agree that today? Yes. 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 Six months takes us to Christmas, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 That's it. 
Is that okay, Councillor Whiteside? I think you're okay, out we'll anyway. have a, a look at it going forward from then. Right. Okay. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you, yes. So, tonight, two to agree. Thank you. Convener, it's uh, Jackie Buchanan. Yeah, just yeah. before we, we go on to the next item, um, in terms of clarity, I must say, I, I've been checking with other officers and I, I wasn't personally terribly clear all, on the conditions in terms of the cat transfer. Um, is it possible to clarify those? And, and apologies, I was checking first before um, coming in on this point, but I, I'm not getting clarity from others either. And it's just um, in terms of the minutes so that we're clear as to what was agreed. I appreciate that there were conditions in terms of um, the, the report itself, but my understanding from what was being said is that they, they, are, they were being added to. And I'd just like to be clear exactly what additions that are being put in place there. Okay, was it the right, that was for, right, for uh, Skills Academy? Yes, item current. number five, convener, thank you. Okay, right, okay. I think we, we were looking at having a change to, to like two of the, see if we can find it. Hmm. It's uh, page 18 of the, the report details the various ah, yeah. conditions. Because I've got, uh, I've got writing all over it, and I, I say I'm, I'm getting cock eyed here. Um, um, I think what we were looking at was changing, like adding to um, one condition one, two, three is okay, five, six, and seven is okay. What we were looking to do was add to Item four, that was agreement being reached with the Council Angus Live on how Skills Academy will ensure adequate community access and fair pricing will apply to the uses of the, the facility uh, and including access for Angus Live and Angus, uh, Angus Council for term, term and holiday coach courses. For term and holiday coach, I think it's coaching courses. And was there mention of um, any sort of access around disability and inclusion? Yes, I've got that. That, that was a, that, there was an added one, number eight, uh, which would be eight, Mrs. Buchanan, uh, agreement that disability access and toilets are included. And I, can I just check that the committee officer has that detail now, please? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. McCaskill. Is that you've got that Mr. detail now? Mr. Wilson is taking the note at the minute, so yes, he, he will have a note of that. Um, okay, Th thank you for that, convener. No problem. Okay, um, agenda item 10 actions taken in response to the COVID 19 pandemic. Uh, it's a report by the Director of Infrastructure. You've got the recommendations. Uh, Ian, do you want to speak to, uh, to this report? Ian Cochran. Thank, thank you, convener. No, not unless there's any questions, but thank you. Okay, I will ask if there's any questions to the support. Councillor Duff. I guess the obvious one is, uh, is this, um, is the moratorium and charging going to last for any specific period of time or you know, are we coming back in six months to look at that? Um, I guess that's the obvious question. The monitorium is on pursuit of uh, existing fines, not uh, in, in terms of uh, existing car parking and, and, and DPE enforcement. It's just on pursuit of, of fines. That's the, uh, the decision that we've taken. Okay, does that answer the question? Okay, yeah, thank you. Okay. Any further questions? Any comments? No? Okay, you've got the recommendation. Uh, one note, two notes, three approves, and four notes. Is the report agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Okay, number 11 is the report on the Angus Adoption Agency and Fostering Panel. It's the annual report for 2019 to 2020. 
Uh, the, uh, the report's by Catherine Lindsay, uh, Director for Children, Families and Justice, and the report, the report was prepared by Eunice McClellan. Can I just thank her for that? There's a lot of work going into this. Uh, excellent, uh, excellent report. Thank, uh, thank you, Eunice. Um, you've, got the recommend uh, you've got the recommendations. Are there any questions? Councillor Whiteside. Thanks, Convena, and thanks to Catherine and Eunice for this report. There's a lot of really good work going on here, and uh, um, the report's excellent. There was just a couple of points I wanted some clarity on. Um, on page 99, um, we note that there's a reduction in kinship allowances being paid. I know that the kinship carers um, undertake a really important role, and they're very valued. I'm just wondering if there's a particular reason why the allowances have gone down. The other question was around the foster carers. I obviously understand how difficult it is to um, recruit new foster carers. And I know that the council works really hard to encourage people to come forward. Um, and it's a thankless task. Um, it's, a, it's a really difficult um, job. However, I'm wondering if the reduction in the, the number of days uh, respite days foster carers get has had an impact on the, the number that we've got. I wonder if you've got an opinion on that. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Councillor, for those questions uh, and the opportunity to address the committee. Um, so firstly, in relation to the reduction of um, kinship payments, um, we make payments to every kinship carer who is eligible. So the differences um, in the number of kinship arrangements that we are making and therefore the number of people who are eligible for a payment as opposed to us not paying people who would be eligible under the scheme. So it's simply a, a pattern in the, the range of placement types that are available for children and young people and then therefore what we're paying out in terms of allowances um, to support those. Um, it is a, a, a trend that we saw uh, at the outset of uh, the new arrangements for kinship where there were some arrangements that were being made and, and uh, children being formally accommodated where formal accommodation wasn't necessarily required. Um, and so the, the change in eligibility there um, is that if uh, accommodation isn't uh, required, then kinship allowances are not payable. Um, and so that's the difference there. But we are monitoring that to make sure um, that there isn't a, a particular trend going on that is of concern. Um, the other question in relation to reduction in respite for foster carers, that's not being cited um, to my knowledge as a reason why people are not coming forward. Um, we are getting a number of carers who are coming forward and we are um, processing those carers um, fairly swiftly um, under all the, the different parts of process and assessment that, that we need to undertake. Um, the difficulty I, I think is that people have now got much more complex lives than arguably they did um, decades ago. Um, people have a range of other complex um, family arrangements that they are um, juggling and managing and uh, in more families, more households, both parents are working. Um, there are also more stringent requirements around the number of children we are now allowed to place with individual foster carers mm -hmm. and there are further regulations around um, what uh, bedroom availability etc um, foster carers must have before we can um, use them. So I think it's a combination of, of those different things that's constraining uh, our ability to be flexible with the number of children we place with an individual carer, but also some of the barriers really um, to supporting carers to come forward. Uh, one of the things that we are considering um, as a service is how we can uh, reconsider our um, further skills scheme review uh, to perhaps address that more fundamentally, but there are significant cost implications and practice implications of, of taking any of those things forward. Those would be subject to a future report to committee um, if, if they bear any fruit. Thank um, you, Catherine. Does that help, Councillor Whiteside? Yeah, thanks. And as I say, it's a really good report. Thanks. Thank you. Right, super. Thank you. Any further questions? Any comments? No? Okay, we've got the recommendations uh, in front of us. Uh, one is endorse the Angus Adoption Agency and Fostering Panel, Panel Annual Report and Support the Future Plans. And two is notes. Is the report agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Okay, we go to number 12. Uh, it's foster carers and homeschooling arrangements during COVID-19. 
Again, the reports by uh, uh, Catherine Lindsay. Um, you've got the recommendations. Perhaps, uh, uh, perhaps Catherine would uh, like to speak to the report. Convenience, Kelly McIntosh, the director. Oh, thank you. Oh, yeah. Um, my, my apologies, Ke Kelly. Sorry. No worries. It's not worries. Oh, I, I, I was just still on mute. <laughs> silenced. Uh, you're silencing me. I'm, I'm beginning to wonder if I had the right report in front of, right in front of my face. Catherine, it is you. <laughs> it is. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. So um, this, this report um, sets out proposals um, to pay foster carers a specific fee in light of the COVID-19 disruption um, to the education for children. Um, so our foster carers, as you know, um, have, have provided care for children at home on a full-time basis uh, when they would not otherwise have been required to do so. Um, our scheme um, allows for various payments um, and we, we wanted to come to ask permission um, really of the committee uh, to institute a specific fee um, that allows us to recognise the additional ask that we've placed on foster carers um, during this difficult time, many of whom are, are juggling those commitments with um, their birth family at home, um, other people that they have caring responsibilities for, and of course some are also still um, juggling employment too. Um, so, it, you know, it was really an opportunity to, to recompense people for that additional um, work that they have been carrying out on our behalf. Thank, thank you, Catherine. I must, I must say, I think we do uh, all have to give them a, a big thank you um, for, for all the work that they're having to do, totally unexpected in, in, these, in these times. So I fully support, the, so the support this paper. Uh, I'll ask them any questions first. Is it Councillor Warren, is that a question? Oh, it's a comment. Okay, no questions. Okay, comments, Councillor Warren? Yep, J just to reiterate what you've said, Convener, I fully support the paper. And again, we'd ask that all of this committee uh, agree with us in recommending the report. But also just to say my thanks as the Convener for Children Learning must go to the uh, foster carers in this hard time for their support and commitment uh, in looking after the cared for children. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comments? No. Okay, we've got the recommendations. One is approve and two require the Director of Children, Families and Justice to apply the amendment. Uh, is that is the report agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Okay, number 13. And this one I'll get right. It is Kelly McIntosh. It's the Recovery Resilience Steps for Angus Schools. Um, you've got uh, all the recommendations in front of you. Are there any questions? Counsel yep. Whiteside. Thank you, Convener. Um, and thanks. And a, another great report. And there's obviously a significant amount of work and planning going on in the education team, uh, despite what some politicians like us to believe. So well done to everybody involved. It's really good to see um, the recruitment of additional uh, temporary teachers and additional sport needs staff. And there's loads and loads of good stuff going on there. I've just got a couple of questions around about the provision of IT equipment and internet for vulnerable children, how we manage to get on top of that to allow everybody um, access to um, learning from their home. And the other question was around are different, when we go back to blended learning, are different schools going to take different approaches depending on the amount of space and outdoor space available? And finally, um, this is a question that comes from Councillor Hans. Um, she wondered if shielding teachers who were perhaps working from home would be able to be buddied up with um, pupils who are shielding um, and there might be um, some benefits to come out of that approach. Thank you. <laughs> Kelly, can you come in? Yes. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. I think I got all of those. So with regards to the IT, uh, we made uh, a submission to Scottish Government on the 9th of June, indicating the number of devices that we need. And that, I don't know if you have seen it, but the Deputy First Minister spoke during this meeting and he mentioned that those returns had been um, received and hopefully we will receive funding soon. There is no time scale there. So it will be funding or, I suspect, devices that will come to us. 
Uh, with regards to the different offer, um, we've tried to state in all of our communication to parents and staff that each of our school has a unique context and the offer that is in place for August is dependent upon the, the number of staff they have available, the capacity of their building, the capacity of the transport to that building to get the children there and the unique context of the school. So some of our schools can actually offer 100% of children full time in wow. school in August just because of the configuration of the classrooms and the number of children on the roll. But I can assure you that every single one of our head teachers and the school leaders in our school have worked really hard. Some of them are on version five or six of trying to accommodate as many children as they can and to do that in sibling groups where possible. Um, so we are, as the government have asked, trying to maximise with the proviso of continuing to offer an environment that is conducive to learning. Um, I, I, I fear that some people might think that the idea is to sardine children in the classrooms and that's really not what we're trying to do. You know, coming to school has to be fun and enjoyable for children. I want it to be a really positive experience and it's going to be new. The routines are going to be new. There's going to be new induction that needs to happen. So, and your last question about shielding. You'll see from the report that currently we know that 48 teachers are shielded and 21 of our support staff. And we do have a number of children who are shielding. There has been work um, ongoing at the moment during lockdown where some specialist staff have worked with children who are shielding, even to the extent of taking them out for walks because that's what they've needed or that's what their family has needed. So that sort of work will continue. And you'll see that I mentioned in the report some sort of outreach blended learning model for those children who will be shielding. And so even with the new announcement earlier this afternoon, there is a reference to some people still not being able to return to school, even if we go back full time due to health concerns. Thank you, Kelly. Thanks, Ben. Okay, Councillor Wan. Thank you, Convener. Can I just say, first of all, I'd like to thank our Director of Education, Kelly Martin Tosh, and the staff for preparing this report in as much detail as it could possibly manage in these circumstances, especially when the guidance is changing weekly and she's, she's reiterated there that we're on to say, section A, so revision five and six in some places. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank all the teachers and staff for their efforts uh, and the commitment shown in ensuring that our young were provided with the best possible education in these unusual times. And of course, finally, but not least, the, the, the pupils who have had to stay at home and try their best to perform their schoolwork in a completely different way. And I would just like to say, can you all please try and enjoy your holidays as best you can when they arrive at the end of this week. I would also ask you to agree the recommendations one to five before us, as this will allow us to prepare the reopening of schools in August 2020, which is really not that far off. However, I would like to take this opportunity, although I know it's possibly been superseded my statement here, and following the lead of Northern Ireland Assembly and reduces social distancing to one metre, but I know John Swinney's announced something similar uh, just not that long ago. This would allow local authorities to prepare our buildings to allow schools and any other surplus buildings to accept 100% of our young back into face-to-face -face learning. We are preparing for the worst case scenario, which is blended learning. However, this takes time to resource and commits a lot of funds that may not be necessary in the end. The action from constituents who face the challenge of not being able to get back to work or the worry that their child will not receive adequate education is concerning. Daily I am receiving correspondence and I'm sure likewise you are also. I was questioned yesterday regarding the statement on the issue of the transport to school, which was in a media release yesterday sent to parents. And I would like to add for the avoidance of doubt, the council is working hard to make school transport arrangements for those who are entitled to it. We are considering all the options, including making multiple journeys or using additional vehicles if available. Despite our best efforts, there is a small chance we may not be able to provide transport to everyone who is entitled to it. Parents and carers will be contacted as soon as possible during the summer to confirm the arrangements. And obviously we are still awaiting commitment, although I might be superseded here again because I haven't heard the full statement that's just happened, to, to ask the government to finance these changes which have been forced upon local authorities by COVID and it's totally unacceptable they have not already done so. But uh, I would just like to commend the report and uh, ask that you agree with it. Thank you. 
Thank you. Well, I'm glad that wasn't the question, Councillor Warren. But thank you for tonight. Thank you for that. Thank you for the comment. Okay, I'm still on questions, Councillor Moore. Thank you. You can be now begin to wonder. <laughs> I've just got two. In paragraph 4.2, there is reference to the Scottish Government announcing additional funding. Um, do we have any more information? And if so, do we know how much we're going to get? And in five points, let's get down to it. 5.2a, we're referring to the 42, sorry, the 48 teachers who are shielding. Um, I presume that they are primary school and senior school, that they've got subjects. Are we in danger of having any subjects being short of teachers? For example, say maths teachers, 40 of the teachers are all maths, etc. Do we, do we know that and have we made provision for it? Kelly? I am going to ask, uh, answer question two, and then I'm going to pass over to Beth Reader for a response to question one. So with regards to shielding staff, we have asked our head teachers this week to clarify individually with staff whether they are extremely clinically vulnerable or clinically vulnerable, and in fact have a shielding letter, and that is informing our decisions on how we will allocate the temporary staff if we receive approval today. We had information from our secondary head teachers last week um, and some of them have since met with teachers about individual risk assessments and so the picture is changing. There is not one subject area that we are particularly worried about. One of the subject areas with a gap in terms of shielding is art and we have other teachers who work within our central team who may be able to help us, not necessarily by being deployed to secondary schools that will be able to help us with your expertise. So I don't foresee any particular issue with subject provision. And I'll pass over to Beth for question one. Thank you, Director. Um, I can confirm we've not had formal notification of our allocation um, as yet, uh, or not with the information I have. I have seen draft guidance that has been prepared, but to my knowledge, we've not had the confirmation, although I'd perhaps um, ask the Director of Finance just in case he has seen anything. Director of Finance. Thank you. Yeah, just, just to clarify that there's two, two elements to the funding. Um, there's 12.6 million for the provision of free school meals over the summer and a, a sum of 15 million, which, which is um, effectively a, a continuation of the other uh, food fund um, uh, provision for, for people who are shielding and otherwise need, need support. Um, there is a paper going to the, the settlement and distribution group this afternoon uh, with proposals around the distribution of the 12.6 million for free school meals. Uh, the, the recommendation from that group will go to cause the leaders uh, possibly as early as this Friday. So we might have some indication uh, this week as to what our allocation will be. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lorimer. Is there any further questions? No comments? No, Councillor McMillan Douglas. Have you got a, I believe you've got a comment. I've got a comment, Karina. Do you want me to go ahead? Yes, please. Um, I just want to say I strongly support the words of uh, my colleague, Councillor Wan, and also applaud the work of officers, teachers and staff who have worked so hard to try and make sense of the constantly changing Scottish Government policy on so-called blended teaching. It seems that not even the Education Minister and the First Minister can agree over this, so it, see, it shows huge skill that our staff have been able to make a policy out of these disagreements. And of course, as Northern Ireland, as, as we know, and has been referenced, has moved to one metre social distancing and if I understand comments, just these last few minutes, there may have been some changes uh, in Scotland, then things will have to be changed again. Um, I really want to concentrate on the huge costs that these additional Scottish Government measures, uh, which we are um, asked to uh, follow, are placing on Angus Council. First, for approval today, 
800,000 for 40 additional teachers and another 130,000 for ad additional school assistants. Officers are rightly recommending that we allocate this money to allow recruitment to take place. And so the interests of children and parents can be protected as best we can. Uh, but we are not funded for this. Uh, as I have pointed out before, the Scottish Government has received over £10 billion from the UK Government for COVID-19 issues. If they really want to make their blended teaching work, and if they really want to help the children of Angus, they should use a tiny part of that 10 billion windfall to meet local authority costs. What else are they hoarding this money for? Secondly, and only for noting today, is the further potentially huge cost, which Kelly has made reference to, of funding transport to and from school. Uh, with the social distancing requirements unless they are fundamentally changed. These costs are not yet calculated, but again, we would ask that Scottish Government should use this, its huge cash windfall to help local authorities meet these costs and benefit children and parents. Thank you, Convener. Thank you, uh, Councillor Duff. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, convener. I think probably I should maybe remind both um, Councillor Wan and Councillor McMillan Douglas that I think our primary responsibility is the safety of the children and the teachers and schools. And I don't know what um, the Deputy First Minister has said this afternoon, but listening to the First Minister at lunchtime, I think she was still fairly strongly in support of the two metre guidance unless the medical opinion had changed. Now, Clearly, between now and 11th of August or 12th of August, that might change. But at the moment, that seems to be the uh, scientific advice she's getting. And I think we should be looking at the safety of the children as our primary responsibility, not perhaps with respect um, how much it's costing us. Okay, thank you, Councillor Duff. Okay, is there any further comments? No, well, we've got the recommendations in front of us. Uh, one, approves if required. Two, is approves. Three, notes. Four, author, authorises. Uh, and the second part of that, and approves the proposed approach. And five, is notes. Uh, is the report agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. I, I'm going to have to apologise again and say my, my eyes are definitely going to go the, Gobbly here. I, I'm going to have to go back to number nine. I, I was supposed to uh, put to you to uh, change to um, uh, the recommendation one. Uh, Mr. McCastle, will I still go for, right forward with that? Uh, sorry, can we? Uh, I just taken me slightly unaware. Could you just kind of articulate what your intention was? Yeah. I'd actually got a note from yourself uh, regarding item nine. That was the uh, the meetings arrangement uh, to, like, to, uh, to change one of the record. It was recommendation one of the reports, so it reads this slightly differently. Yes, convener. Thank you. So my 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 apologies for, like, like for this. So if you've got the item nine there, um, the one that. The, not, not the the change to the recommendation. I've been informed technically under the current legislative legislative rules, as per the report agreed at April Full Council, uh, remote participation can only take place on the direction of the chair of the meeting. So we ask the committee to change recommendation one of the report so it reads one agrees that for reasons set out in paragraph 4b of this report, council and committee meetings be held remotely as outlined in that paragraph, subject to the appropriate direction of the chair of the meeting. Is that agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Lovely. Thank you again. Thank my, you. My, 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 my apologies. Okay, we go to item 14. At Cycling, Walking and Safer Routes, routes Fund, it's a programme of works 
Um, we have the recommendations in front of us. I'm just going to make uh, a comment. I had a, I received a call this morning from uh, uh, from the chair of the community council in Brecon. Um, none too happy, I'm afraid, at uh, uh, how. Uh, a particular project in Brechin uh, had overseeded uh, one in Drum, Drum Achley loan. Um, so I would ask perhaps that uh, if we can, we can have a, 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 a another look at that. I don't know if that's possible or, uh, or not, but uh, I said I, right, that I would put that forward. Um, are there any questions to this report? Um, I have. Councillor Salmon. Yeah, I was going to be moving this report, um, but um, I'd like to actually bring forward an additional recommendation. Uh, to, it's really to apply to next year's report. So if I could read out the additional recommendation. Let's agree that all future CWSR reports contain the full list of projects which have met the CWSR criteria with where practical rankings, costings, locations, and any outstanding issues being detailed along with the officer's recommendations. And my reasoning for the additional uh, recommendation is to provide more openness and transparency to the councillors and the public to let us all see the details of all the projects which met the criteria, not just the projects which are outlined in the committee report. And I'm doing this after feedback from my administration colleagues who obviously would like to get more information about projects submitted by the public in their parts of Angus over and above the ones that appear in the report. As the report indicates, 300 projects were submitted, 64 met the criteria and 12 came to committee for approval. I feel it's important that all of us know about the other 52 in this instance that didn't come to committee. So if we agree the additional recommendation, this information will be provided in next year's report. Thank you, Councillor Salmon. Uh, I must say I'm, I'm quite happy with the, the, the further recommendation, so I'll put it to the committee. Uh, do you agree that we add that? Agreed. 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 Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, so we'll go to questions. I've got Councillor Duff. Yeah, f thanks, convener. It was really a question for the, the convener, Councillor Salmond. Um, some time ago, he put out an email um, advising how much was available for, I think it was 2021, which from memory was about 602,000. Uh, 602, I'm a little bit confused because for, for 2021, we've got a figure of about 500,000 here. Is that the same amount of money or have we got two pots of money for cycling and walking and rural routes, etc. Can, can maybe Councillor Salmon clarify that one? Answer that. I know you tried to phone me today and I did return uh, your phone message. Um, yeah, the figure I put out in the email encouraging colleagues to put forward uh, projects and speak with their community groups to encourage them to put forward projects, yeah, did indicate the 512,000, which is the figure that's in the report today. There's no additional pot of money. It's the 512,000 that was... Uh, given to us by the Scottish Government through this fund. <laughs> okay, th thanks for clarifying. Obviously, very much welcome the report and, and the, the, the routes that are funded. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Whiteside. Thanks, convener. My, my initial question was actually exactly the same as yours, but I thought it was worth pointing out that Councillor Brays has had several communications about the exact same, same issue, just for the record. Um, also, um, I welcome the range of different projects in the different towns, but I note that they are all in towns and I sometimes think that rural areas get missed out and we could do with some um, good connections from villages, smaller villages to larger villages, etc. So I hope that can be taken into consideration in future years. But, but good news, uh, a good news story in general, so thanks. Yeah, thank you Councillor White, Whiteside. I do believe that uh, the further recommendation from Councillor Salmon will be helpful for next year. Yeah. But yeah, and you're absolutely right. Uh, some uh, terrific projects uh, going forward. Uh, have we got any uh, any further comments on that? No. 
Yeah. Okay, yeah. we'll move. Oh, sorry. Yeah, thank you, convener. Yes, I do welcome this report, and I would ask the officers, where possible, to possibly consider making the road one way and can close the other half of the carriageway so that people can socially distance. I've just quickly looked at the internet and the First Minister has stated that the two metres is going to remain, so we've got to allow for that. We need to encourage car use. We need to get people out walking, cycling. It says I live, live somewhere where I can't get anywhere except by car. So, you know, look at every option we can to try and discourage cars and get people out. Thank you, Councillor Moore. Okay, you've got the recommendation notes and two uh, approves and we will get the direct hello. Oh. Sorry, convener. Um, can, um, Ian Cochran would like to speak, please, if you get the opportunity. Please. Yes, yes, go ahead. Thank you, convener. If I could perhaps pick up a, a, a number of those points. Um, first of all, we're, we're, we're happy with the um, uh, additional recommendation, happy to bring the list to you. Uh, we're actually delighted that we've had such a, a large number of bids from uh, members of the public um, but even just the, the 64 uh, that we concentrated on that, that passed some of the criteria were valued at 13 and a half million pounds. So given that we only have half a million pounds, then clearly the demand for cycling and walking in, in Angus is, 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 um, is, is out there, uh, but not which what we were actually able to provide for. Um, uh, in, in terms of uh, the specifics of the Beacon projects, you know, that is based on, on cost and uh, land access and the likes, and we'll happily uh, deal with the email that I've been forwarded separately. Uh, to answer Councillor White's uh, side's question, um, uh, part the, the, we, we have got a number of very ambitious uh, village to, to other villages or, or, or major settlement, but the, the, it comes with major cost, and therefore that's part of the problem here. We're very conscious that the projects we're delivering this year need to be delivered in what is now only nine months along with some you know ongoing restrictions that will be there so land purchase and the likes has ruled out a number of, uh, of projects and finally to answer councillor moore's uh, inquiry uh, this is separate to the uh, spaces for everybody money uh, sorry spaces for, for people money for the temporary restrictions that yep. were currently being made available so we can consider the uh, the options around that, and that's ongoing discussions, uh, as you, you're aware of, and I think you've been involved in. So thank you, convener. Okay, thank you. Okay, any further comments? No, okay, the recommendations, one notes, two approves, and the second part of that, of two delegates, the Director of Infrastructure and Service Leader. Is the report agreed? Agreed. agreed. Convener, along with the additional recommendation. Yes. With the additional recommendation. Additional recommendation from Councillor Salmond. As, as, yes. as. Thank you. Okay. Item 15, the uh, Arbroath Brothic Water Flood Protection Scheme update. The reports by the Director of Infrastructure, but the report author has got Walter Scott. Um, you've got the recommendations, and I'll say it's questioned. Any questions first? No comments. I know I've got Councillor Warren. No, I'm fine, uh, Convener. Thank you. Oh, beg your pardon. It's Councillor Moore. Councillor Moore. Yes, thank you, Convener. I'm delighted to support these recommendations. I know of the scheme through Ralph Coots, who's untimely passing recently, I think is a great loss to the area. We had quite a few discussions about the impacts on wildlife. The only thing I would say about this scheme is that it would be a sad reflection if in trying to catch up, we did damage to the, um, the habitat of the wildlife that is there. Thank you. Any further comments? 
Well, I'm, uh, I must say, uh, I certainly welcome uh, welcome the support. Uh, um, having been a councillor uh, the last ten years, three times I've seen uh, severe flooding in right in Arbroath. Once I was right, uh, I got a call from from the Kirkton area, uh, and as I walked down, virtually waded through Hercules Den. Uh, the water was right halfway up the right the goalpost at the football right the football pitch. So yeah, this is welcome. Uh, been a long time coming. So. Well, right, look, right, look forward to it moving forward. Uh, you've got the recommendations in front of you. One is notes and two approves. Is the report agreed? Agreed. Okay, 16 is land acquisition. That's Jubilee Park, uh, Latham. You've got the recommendation. Uh, are there any questions? No questions, any comments? Councillor Moore. Thank you, convener. I hope you will indulge me in going slightly off topic. I have no objection to this land acquisition, but when it was dealt with before I was elected, when I look at it, I would ask officers to simply look at paragraphs 3.3 .3 and 3.5. 3.3, the only accesses are in the same corner. If there was a problem in that corner, like a major fire, the entire estate would be trapped when they're talking about 30 houses. And they also refer to provides better connectivity between parts of the village and the school. And I have no idea how they're proposing to do that. So I would appreciate some comeback outside the meeting, please. Sure you'll get that, Councillor Moore. Uh, any further comments? Any yeah, not comments, questions, beg your pardon. Any questions, comments? Well, all I can say is uh, um, this is actually good news. Uh, it will be new affordable housing uh, for, the, for, the, for the area, certainly much needed. So you've got the recommendation in front of you. Uh, it's recommended that the committee approves. Is the report agreed? Great. Thank you. Okay, number 17 uh, is the key supplier support update to report by Ian Lorimer. Um, we've got the recommendations there. Any questions? Is it a question, Councillor Duff? Yeah, it is a very, a very brief question and apologies. Yeah. Just, just page 142 group applications can, can someone explain in, in simple terms what a group application is because it wasn't clear to wasn't clear to me where's that page 140 142 group applications it's in our i think that's an appendix appendix one. Oh. Oh. one need to take that one convener yeah could you please mr Lorimer? Yeah, so there, there's some of our suppliers, and it's particularly in relation to school and public transport and early years uh, provision, where the suppliers have all, to a large extent, been impacted in much the same way. So rather than requiring each of those suppliers to apply for support individually, um, we're looking at taking those on an individual basis. It still requires an individual contract variation, but it just simplifies the kind of paperwork part of that. Uh, if, if any supplier doesn't want to be part of the group application, they can still apply as an individual uh, supplier. So that, that's what we mean by group group applications. Thank you. Is that helpful? Yeah, thank okay. you very much. Any, any other questions? Any comments? No? We've got the recommendation. One notes, two reviews, and three notes. Is the report agreed? Agreed. agreed. Thank you. We now go to possible exclusion of public and press. Uh, is that agreed? Agreed. Agreed. And we all move from, we exit Zoom and we use the Skype invitation. So I'll give you a good five or so minutes to get into that. Thank you.